Permanent subcommittee investigations will come to order. It seems no industry is immune from data breaches that expose sensitive consumer information. Some of the biggest breaches we've seen recently include Google, Uber, Facebook, the department store Saks Fifth Avenue. Government agencies have not been immune from this. They've also suffered significant breaches, including over 20 million security clearance files, background files that were held by the Office of Personnel Management. Locating network vulnerabilities that hackers can exploit to gain access to sensitive information is a key issue. Actually, Senator Hassan and I have worked on this with some specific legislation. She's here this morning. Earlier this year, the President signed our Hack DHS Act, as an example, into law, which will strengthen DHS's cybersecurity by using white hat hackers to locate previously unknown vulnerabilities in the Department's systems. Last night, Senator Carper and I released a report on how the Equifax data breach occurred and how hackers were able to steal personal and financial data from over 145 million Americans. That report documents how Equifax failed to follow basic cybersecurity practices and protocols which prevented the company from identifying and patching an exploitable vulnerability on its system. During the course of our investigation, we also learned the company failed to preserve important documents related to the breach. Equifax employees told us they frequently used a chat application called Microsoft Link. When Equifax first discovered the breach on July 29, 2017, the security team used that chat platform to discuss the hack system and even the company's response. Our report uncovered that Equifax did not issue a notice not to destroy documents related to the breach until August 22, 2017 and failed to set the platform, the chat platform to archive any of these chats until September 15, 2017, a month and a half after the breach was discovered, again back on July 29th. Prior to September 15th, Equifax was not archiving any linked chats based on its own document retention policy. Counsel for Equifax told the subcommittee they could not find any of the chats Equifax employees told us about documenting the discovery of the breach. As a result, the subcommittee is left with an incomplete record. So are the American people. After discovering the breach, Equifax waited six weeks to disclose to the public on September 7, 2017, that hackers had compromised its collection of personal and financial information, again, on over 145 million Americans. Adding to this delay, the hackers had access to the information since May 13, 2017, three months before they were discovered. Equifax Chief Executive Officer Mark Vigor is here today to discuss our report's finding. We're also going to hear today from Arnie Sorensen, Marriott's Chief Executive Officer, on the data breach his company disclosed in November 2018. That breach of the Starwood Reservation database occurred in July 2014, two years before Marriott acquired Starwood in September of 2016. But this was not the first time Starwood suffered a data breach. In November 2015, Starwood announced it had discovered malware on some of its systems at hotels designed to steal credit card information at the point of sale. At the time, Starwood stated this breach did not impact its guest reservation database. In November 2018, Marriott announced that it had discovered a hacker that had accessed the Starwood guest reservation database. Marriott's investigation determined that the hacker had access to guest information related to 383 million guest records since 2014. As part of that database, the hackers also gained access to over 23 million passport numbers and 9.1 million credit card numbers, most of which were expired. Marriott learned of the breach on September 8, 2018, but waited almost 12 weeks to notify the public on November 30, 2018. The goal of today's hearing and the subcommittee's report is to fully understand these breaches, but also to focus on the future, to focus on solutions. Companies and government agencies alike must take steps to better protect the data consumers entrust to them. That is clear. And when that data is compromised, we need to know as soon as possible so we can do everything we can to ensure criminals are no longer taking advantage of us as consumers. That seems clear. So I look forward to working with my ranking member, Senator Carper, and others on this committee, uh, including the chairman, Senator Hassan, and ensuring that we can move forward with legislation that ensures both the protection of consumer data and prompt notification when data is compromised. I also want to thank Senator Carper and his staff for their dedication to these issues and to him and his staff for leading this investigation. With that, I turn to Senator Carper for his opening statement. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Our thanks to both of our witnesses this morning for, for joining us. Um, and I, I want to take a moment just to say a special thanks to the members of the minority staff, the members of the majority staff who have worked hard for months to prepare us for, uh, for, this, uh, for this day. According to a 2017 study by the Pew Research Center, the vast majority of Americans have personally experienced a major data breach. My guess is most of us in this room on this side of the panel are among them. And about half uh, of our country believe their personal information is less secure than it was five years ago. Our subcommittee initiated investigation into the causes of private sector data breaches shortly after Equifax announced its uh, breach in the fall of 2017. As we conducted our work, a seemingly endless stream of new high-profile incidents were announced. One after the other, well-known companies including Google, Facebook, Ticketfly, T-Mobile, Orbitz, Saks Fifth Avenue, Lord & Taylor, Under Armour, and eventually Marriott, announced that they too had suffered breaches. Mr. Begor and Mr. Sorensen, we thank you for your appearance today and for your help in better understanding how these private sector data breaches occur and what can be done to prevent them, including steps that we can take. While my colleagues and I will have some tough questions for you, our goal, as the Chairman has indicated, our goal here is to ensure that the mistakes and oversights that contributed to the attacks your company suffered are well understood so that other American businesses are less likely to fall victim to hackers. When hackers are able to obtain someone's personal information, the consequences are real. The 2017 Pew study I referred to found that more than 40% of the individuals polled had discovered fraudulent charges on their credit cards. Others reported that someone had attempted to take out loans in their name, file tax returns in their name, or steal their identity. Several of those things had happened to my own family, and I suspect, I suspect to the families of many of us in this room. Even when a breach victim is fortunate enough to avoid becoming a victim of, of crimes like these, they often deal with months or even years of hassle and worry as they swap out compromised credit and debit cards, change their online passwords, and monitor their bank accounts and credit reports for suspicious activities. Given the vast amount of information collected on consumers these days, and the skill and relentlessness of the hackers seeking to steal that information, it is critical that businesses make cybersecurity a priority at the very top level of a company, the board, the CEOs as well. The constant stream of data breach notifications we see year in and year out is a sign to me that we could and should be doing a lot better. As my colleagues have heard me say many times, everything I do, I know I can do better. The same is true of all of us. And in this one particular area, we need as a country to do a whole lot better. And it's a shared responsibility. Equifax and its two main competitors, TransUnion and Experian, have built their business models around the collection and dissemination of consumers' most sensitive financial information. That includes names, nicknames, dates of birth, social security numbers, telephone numbers, current and former addresses, account balances, and payment histories. This data collection is not something consumers can opt out of. Credit reporting agencies collect personal information without our knowledge or our explicit authorization. If someone shops regularly at a retail chain that gets hacked, that person can opt not to shop there any longer. If doing so makes them uncomfortable. They cannot, however, keep their information away from Equifax. Knowing this, you'd think that protecting the sensitive information its entire business relies on would be Equifax's top priority. Yet information obtained by this uh, subcommittee and included in a bipartisan report uh, released last night illustrates a years-long neglect of basic cybersecurity practices and a decision by company officials to prioritize the case of doing business over security. In 2015, Equifax officials learned through an internal audit that the company's IT systems were riddled with thousands of unpatched vulnerabilities, hundreds of them deemed critical or high risks. They also learned that the company lacked a mature inventory of its IT assets, making it more difficult to address problems as they arose. 
By the time the Department of Homeland Security announced in March of 2017 that versions of the widely used web application software Apache Struts included a serious security flaw, Equifax had still not properly responded to its 2015 audit findings or brought its cybersecurity practices in line with industry standards. Despite being informed that the announced flaw in Apache Struts was extremely dangerous and easy to exploit, Equifax officials appear to have approached the challenge it presented with no sense of urgency whatsoever. Scans of the company's networks failed to find the vulnerable version of Apache Struts it was using, and key staff who were in positions to make the necessary security enhancements were let off, left off internal communications. The vulnerability was discussed at regular security meetings held in March and April of 2017, but it's not clear who attended those meetings. Senior managers interviewed by the subcommittee were nominally in charge of IT management and cybersecurity at Equifax, and they told subcommittee staff that they did not regularly attend the meetings themselves. Former top Equifax officials were interviewed were very frank about the priority they place on cybersecurity. One key former security official told our subcommittee staff that, quote, security wasn't first, close quote, at Equifax. And that is an understatement. The company's former chief information officer was extremely dismissive of the importance of key security processes during his interview, saying that he considered the patching of security flaws to be a, quote, lower level responsibilities that was six levels down from him, close quote. There's no evidence that these new two individuals or any other top executives at Equifax directed staff to take steps to update the company's IT asset inventory and conduct a more thorough search for the vulnerable Apache Struts software. This lack of initiative would be bad enough on its own. But Equifax also left itself blind to incoming attacks by allowing the tools it needed to monitor for malicious web tra traffic to expire. So when hackers moved in May of 2017 to attack Equifax through a version of Apache Struts, still in use on the company's websites, nobody saw them coming. What's more, nobody discovered them until July 78 uh, days after the hackers first gained entry. During the 78 days the hackers spent inside of Equifax's IT network, they accused, they accessed rather, multiple data repositories containing information on more than 145 million people, and probably half the people in this room were among them. There are tools available that could have been sent uh, alerts to Equifax staff as the hackers manipulated the information in the databases, but Equifax had not installed them once Equifax found the hackers at the end of July 2017, Equifax executives waited an additional six weeks before letting the public know what had happened. Six weeks. So because Equifax was unaware of all the assets it owned, unable to patch the Apache Struts vulnerability, and unable to detect attacks on key portions of its network, consumers were left unaware for months the criminals had obtained their most sensitive personal and financial information. Consumers were also unaware that they should take steps to protect themselves from fraud. And importantly, these failures stand in stark contrast to the experiences of TransUnion and Experian, which both quickly identified and addressed the same Apache struts vulnerability and have not announced data breaches. I have a friend, you ask him how he's doing, he says, compared to what? And I think the obvious question here is for Equifax compared to TransUnion and Experian. The data breach announced by Marriott this past November doesn't appear to have been caused by the kind of cultural indifference to cybersecurity the record indicates existed at Equifax. Rather, it looks like Marriott inherited this attack through its acquisition of, of Starwood. With the size of this breach, up to 500 million people were reported to have been affected at one point, requires that we take a close look and learn what happened and why. 
I have questions about Marriott's uh, data reteach retention policy, for example. I, understood, uh, I understand why a hotel chain might collect passport information in some cases, but I don't know why it would need to maintain records of millions of guest passport numbers, as appears to have occurred in this case. This incident also raises questions about the degree to which cybersecurity concerns do and should play a role in merger and acquisition decisions. In Starwood, Marriott acquired a company that it knew had serious cybersecurity challenges and had actually been attacked before. Despite this, Marriott chose to initially leave Starwood's security system in place after acquiring the company. We need to learn more about the priority that Marriott executives chose to place on addressing security flaws at Starwood as it worked to integrate its system into its own. What we do know today is that large-scale data breaches are not going to stop. We can't afford to shrug our soldiers and write them off as a cost of doing business. There are real costs to approaching cybersecurity challenges with this frame of mind, and real harm that can occur both to consumers' pocketbooks and to the company's bottom lines. Here in Congress, I think it's long past time for us to come to agreement on a federal data security law that lays out for private industry what we expect from them, both in data protection and in data breach notification. We also need to ensure that the system we've established for sharing information on cyber threats and cybersecurity best practices is as effective as it can be, and is it updated over time. If a company is as large and sophisticated as Equifax can fa fail so badly, at implementing basic cybersecurity practices, we can certainly do a better job making clear what will and won't, what work, won't work when it comes to blocking hackers and preventing data breaches. My thanks again, Mr. Chairman, for the work that you and your staff and my staff have put into this complex and important issue. We look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Senator Carper. And I'd like to call the first panel of witnesses. Uh, first, we have Mark Begor, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Equifax. He served in that capacity since April 2018. Again, as we just heard, the Equifax breach occurred or uh, was discovered in July of 2017. Uh, second, Arnie Sorensen is here. He's the President and Chief Executive Officer of Marriott International Inc. He's held that position since 2012. Again, as we just heard, Marriott acquired Starwood in 2016. The breach occurred at Starwood in 2014 and was discovered in 2018. We're also going to swear in someone else this morning. Uh, Jamil Farshi, who's the current Chief Information Security Officer, Equifax. It was requested should Mr. Begor uh, need some uh, special expertise, technical assistance. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand as well. It's a custom of the subcommittee to swear in all of our witnesses. So at this time, I'd ask you all to please stand and raise your right hand. Please repeat after me. Do you swear the testimony you will give? I'm sorry, I just respond to this. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you guide. Let the record reflect the witnesses, all three answered in the affirmative. Uh, gentlemen, all your written testimony will be printed in the record in its entirety, so I'd ask that you try to limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Uh, Mr. Bergor, we'll hear from you first. Chairman Portman, Ranking Member Carper, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm Mark Begor, Chief Executive Officer of Equifax. With me today is Jamil Farsi, our Chief Information Security Officer. Let me begin by expressing my personal regret for the disruption that our 2017 cyber attack had on millions of Americans. Cybercrime is one of the greatest threats facing our country today. U.S. corporations are continually fighting criminals that operate outside the rule of law and attempt to steal data for their own gain. These attacks are no longer a hacker in the basement attempting to penetrate a company's security perimeter, but instead are carried out by increasingly sophisticated criminal rings and even more challenging nation states that are well-funded or the military arms of nation states. These attacks on U.S. businesses are attacks on U.S. consumers and are attacks on America. This war is getting more challenging and more sophisticated, and there's no end in sight. 
Fighting these attackers will require cooperation between government, law enforcement, and the private sector. We appreciate that members of this subcommittee have introduced legislation that promotes this type of partnership, and we support these efforts. The fact that Equifax suffered a data breach does not mean the company did not have appropriate data security program or that the company failed to take cybersecurity seriously. I understand that before the attack, the company's security program was well-funded and staffed and leveraged strong administrative and technical safeguards. In April 2018, when I joined Equifax, I made a personal commitment, internally and externally, to building a culture within Equifax where security is part of our DNA and committed that Equifax would be an industry leader around data security. I'm proud of the leadership, cultural enhancements, and investments that Equifax has made over the past 18 months. We've added experienced senior leaders and board members to enhance our security and technology skill sets. And in 2018 alone, we added close to 1,000 incremental security and IT professionals to our team. Between 2018 and 2020, we are increasing our technology and security spending by 50%, totaling an incremental $1.25 billion. We recognize that being an industry leader means actively sharing our security learnings and best practices. We have been openly sharing all of our, our cyber learnings with our customers, our competitors, the US government, and the rest of the private sector. Last year, we established a number of private secure, I'm sorry, we established a number of meaningful security partnerships that will help raise the entire security community by leveraging our joint learnings. In addition to the goal of being a leader in data security, Equifax has been working diligently to support US consumers. When Equifax announced the cyber attack, its response was guided by a desire to focus on helping and supporting consumers first. Since the 2017 incident, Equifax has invested more than $80 million to assist impacted consumers. When we announced the incident, we offered an identity theft and credit monitoring service free for all Americans, regardless if they were impacted by the cyber incident. Last November, when that service was nearing its end, Equifax voluntarily extended that protection for another year. Going forward, we are investing over $50 million to make it easier for consumers to interact with us, both over the internet and in our call centers. We want to make sure we are a consumer-friendly credit bureau at every step of the way. To close, I'd like to thank Chairman Portman for holding this hearing. Equifax is committed to our mission to become an industry leader in data security, and we are investing unprecedented resources in technology, security, and people. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and for your focus on protecting American businesses and consumers from cyber attacks. Thank you, Mr. McGorm. Mr. Sorensen, we'll now hear from you. Chairman Portman, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to, te to testify today. The subject of the subcommittee is tackling private sector cyber attacks is an increasingly urgent one, one that has hit Marriott directly with the data security incident we announced on November 30, 2018. We deeply regret this incident and are committed to determining how it occurred, supporting our affected guests, and enhancing security measures to protect, protect against future attacks. For 91 years, Marriott has been in the business of serving people. We began as a small family business in Washington, D.C., serving hamburgers and root beer at the hot shops. Today, we are a global hospitality company conducting operations in all 50 of the United States and 130 countries and territories. Throughout that time, we have built our reputation by putting people first and focusing on the care of our guests. As a company that prides itself on taking care of people, 
We recognize the gravity of this criminal attack on the Starwood Guest Reservation database and our responsibility for protecting data concerning our guests. To all of our guests, I sincerely apologize. We are working hard every day to rebuild your confidence in us. Because this incident involved a Starwood database, let me provide some background on the merger of Marriott with Starwood. Marriott signed a merger agreement with Starwood in November 2015 and closed the transaction in September 2016. Between these two events, we obtained information about Starwood's network and conducted an assessment on integrating the two systems, although this inquiry was legally and practically limited by the fact that until the merger closed, Starwood remained a direct competitor. We made the decision to retain Marriott's reservation system as the central system for the combined group of hotels and to retire Starwood system. Migrating all of Starwood's 1,270 hotels onto Marriott's reservation system while avoiding disruption of the reservation process was a significant undertaking that took us about two years. We made additional investments to enhance security of the system while it was operating. Following discovery of the incident, we accelerated retirement of Starwood's reservation system, and as of December 18, 2018, are no longer using the Starwood Guest Reservation database to conduct business or operations. Until our investigation of the incident announced on November 30, we were unaware that the Starwood Guest Reservation database had been infiltrated by an attacker. Our investigation was initiated following an alert on September 7, 2018, from a cybersecurity tool. In response, our IT team swiftly implemented containment measures. We retained industry experts to conduct a forensic investigation and deploy additional defenses. Unraveling the scope of the attack required extensive forensic work by experts. We also contacted the FBI, which continues its investigation. As our investigation unfolded, we learned that the intruder had been in the Starwood system since 2014. On November 19 of 2018, we determined that the intruder had accessed files containing personal information of guests who had made reservations at Starwood Properties. We believe that the upper limit for the total number of guest records involved in this incident is approximately 383 million. What do we mean by guest records? Take my name for an example, which is in the database multiple times with variations such as Arnie Sorensen, Arnie M. Sorensen, Arnie Morris Sorensen, sometimes with my home address, other times with my business address, and yet again without, and again without any address. Each entry represents a separate record, even though they all relate to one person. We cannot confidently determine whether records with similar names or even identical names are, uh, represent one person or multiple people, but we know that the information for fewer than 383 million unique people was involved. In the days immediately after November 19, we worked quickly to make sure that we could share useful information with our guests. On November 30, we provided broad public notice of the incident via a press release and notification banners across Marriott and Starwood websites and apps. We stood up a website with consumer information in multiple languages, as well as call centers to answer questions, and offered guest-free web monitoring services, among other steps. In assessing the impact of this event, you should know that Starwood did not keep guest social security numbers and the overwhelming majority of payment card information was encrypted. To date, we have not found data removed from the Starwood database on the internet or dark web, which we continue to monitor. Finally, we know this is a race that has no finish line. Cyber attacks are a pervasive threat. We are committed to responding to these evolving threats with a layered defense approach and continuous improvement. Our founder, Jay Willard Marriott, was fond of saying that success is never final. We are applying that critical review process to learn from this incident as we work diligently to regain the level of trust that our guests have come to expect from us over the years. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. I'd like to thank both the witnesses for their statements, um, and I think they make a good point that this is a matter that requires cooperation between government and the private sector uh, at every level. Um, I'm going to delay my questioning until we have a chance to be sure that our two colleagues, who I know have other commitments, have a chance to ask theirs. Um, so uh, for this first round, I, I will be coming back and asking some questions. I want to give them a chance first before they have to leave. And I now turn to my ranking member, Senator Carper. 
Senator uh, Hassan, if you and uh, Senator Rosen have uh, other obligations, go ahead and ask your questions. All right, thanks. Um, again, thank you. Um, I think it was Maya McGinnis who used to say, uh, uh, people may not uh, uh, remember what you say, that they may not remember what you do, but they'll remember how you uh, made them feel. My, Maya Angelou, Maya Angelou. People may not remember what you said, they may not remember what you do, they'll remember what you, how you made them feel. And um, first I want to say, I was glad to hear both of you apologize. The, um, I always say to my kids, uh, they're now grown, the three most important words are um, please and thank you. And the uh, couple of others that mean a lot are I'm sorry, especially when we screw up. And uh, especially with respect to, uh, to Equifax, the, uh, the amount of screw up is just almost unbelievable. But Equifax has known since 2015 that its approach to cybersecurity was lacking. And among other issues, Equifax learned that during an internal audit that was conducted that year that the company had left a number of critical and high-risk security uh, uh, flaws unpatched. The company also learned it uh, lacked a comprehensive IT asset inventory, meaning it would be difficult to address new security issues as they were brought to the company's attention. When the Department of Homeland Security informed the public about a major security risk in certain versions of Apache Struts, apparently a very commonly used uh, piece of software, it also told the public that the vulnerability was easy to exploit. Knowing all of that, Equifax relied on the same flawed policies and procedures which ultimately failed to identify the presence of the vulnerable versions of Apache Struts. Equifax circulated a notice about the vulnerability to an email list that did not include application owners. Put the issues on the agenda of two meetings that senior leaders failed to attend regularly and conducted repeated scans that failed to identify the vulnerability, which allowed hackers to access the online dispute portal. Mr. Bigor, if Aquifax knew that it lacked a mature inventory of its IT assets, why didn't senior IT and security officials, staff, do more to improve the inventory before the 2017 data breach specifically? Why did Equifax fail to conduct a follow-up audit after the 2015 review to determine whether the company had made progress in addressing its patch management issues? Uh, ranking member, uh, I think as you know, I joined in April of 2018. Uh, in the first few weeks of joining Equifax, I went into great detail about, um, you know, the forensics on what caused the breach, what our routines and processes were in place at the time. And as I stated in my testimony, you know, there were controls in place. They clearly weren't strong enough. And, uh, you know, we've taken great steps since then. Uh, uh, we've doubled uh, the size of our security team. Uh, I talked in my testimony uh, a few minutes ago about our increased spending on data and security um, and uh, our approach to uh, making security central uh, to the DNA of the company. We also changed uh, the incentives in the company. Uh, we're very unique, uh, I think, in corporate America that in our bonus system, which the top uh, 3,900 out of 11,000 employees participate in an annual bonus, 25% of that bonus is tied to cybersecurity, and that went in place in 2018. It's continuing in 2019, and will continue going forward. And uh, ranking member, that um, uh, incentive is only punitive, meaning if we don't make progress on our security improvements, if we don't take our security forward, um, you can only reduce the individual's bonus, including mine. Um, so there's real um, buy-in, and making security a part of our DNA we think is quite critical. I would also say that, um, and I, I think Mr. Sorensen said the same thing, um, this won't end, you know, meaning uh, you can never be good enough. Um, and the investments and spending, you know, will continue. And as I pointed out, uh, we've increased our technology and security spending in 18, 19, and 20 uh, by 50 percent. So security is a top priority at Equifax. It's a top priority of mine and the board and the leadership team and the whole organization going forward. I spent a lot of years of my life in the Navy. I'm a retired Navy captain and Vietnam veteran. And we uh, have a standard in the Navy and a process, uh, process in the Navy that uh, says if uh, the captain of the ship 
is asleep in his or uh, her ward room in the middle of the night and his ship runs aground, the captain of the ship is held responsible. Has that happened in this case? Well, it, in my view, uh, uh, Senator, it, it, it has. Um, you know, I think you know that the prior CEO is no longer with the company. Uh, the prior CISO is no longer with the company. The prior CTO is no longer with the company. Uh, if you look at our technology and security organization, um, we've upgraded um, really strong talent in probably two-thirds of both of those organizations. And as I talked about, uh, you know, we've added significant uh, um, resources, 1,000 incremental people. We have, a th a, a we have 10,000 people globally at the beginning of last year. At the end of last year, we have 1,100, and those were all in security and technology. So, you know, there was a, a lot of accountability. Again, I wasn't there, um, but uh, there's a new team at Equifax that takes security intensely seriously. Uh, your com uh, Equifax's competitors, which have the same extremely sensitive data uh, on American consumers as Equifax, operated with a uh, strongest sense of urgency once they learned about the Apache Struts uh, vulnerability. And as, as you assumed the leadership of this uh, organization, you must have wondered why, if they're doing this, why didn't we uh, at Equifax? And uh, we've asked about what you've done. Uh, you are, I explained a bit about you, what you've done to change the culture of, of your company around cybersecurity. If you're advising other, other companies, whether they happen to be companies that are just deal in the, the sort of business that you have, your business model, what advice would you have for those other companies uh, today yeah, you know, first is um, it's a war, and, and I think uh, the, 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 Mr. Sorensen said the same thing, and I think this committee understands that, uh, that these uh, criminals, um, other actors that are attacking U.S. companies are increasingly sophisticated. Um, we get attacked multiple times per day, and actually the system we have now, I get an alert on my phone from my chief security officer and his team when there is an attempted attack um, on Equifax. And you know, point number one is it's not going to go away. And point number two is uh, we really applaud the committee's uh, focus on sharing best practices. And I think, as the uh, as the senator may know, um, that's challenging sometimes for a company that goes through a data security breach to be open about actually having it. And these forums, I think, are critically important. When I joined Equifax in April, my first call was to my two competitors, and what I told both of them was, "There's no trade secrets." around data security. This is a war we face as an industry. It's a war we face for American companies, as you pointed out, for the government. And it's one that's not going to end. And, and we applaud the idea of sharing actively what we're learning from each other. You know, what are those IP address that are known bad actors? If one company knows it, let's make sure the next company knows it and share those so we can really build our defenses up because it uh, is increasingly sophisticated and challenging. The uh, close uh, with this round with the, this, this thought. The Constitution of our country was first ratified in Delaware, December 7, 1787. Uh, we ratified before anyone else had. The very beginning of the Constitution starts with these words in preamble. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. It doesn't say in order to form a perfect union, a more perfect union. Our goal in this realm has to be uh, perfection, knowing we'll never get there, but we need to strive for that. Thank you. Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ranking Member Carper, uh, both of you for this investigation, but also for your bipartisan leadership of this committee. And uh, thank you to both of our witnesses for being here today. Um, let me start with a couple of questions, Mr. Begor, to you. You said in your testimony that you believe that despite some errors, Equifax took cybersecurity very seriously even before the 2017 breach. I know that the 2017 breach occurred before your time at the helm of the company, but the facts presented in the subcommittee's report make clear that the company's pre-breach pre security practices were really not in keeping with serious cyber security practice. The report shows that Equifax had forgotten to update a security certificate known as an SSL certificate that encrypted data transfers between Equifax's customers and website. When Equifax developers attempted to install new certificates, they realized that some of the old ones had expired as much as eight months earlier. That failure led to the exploitation 
as you've acknowledged, of millions of Americans' data by what appears to be Chinese hackers. Equifax should have routinely audited its SSL certificates to make sure they hadn't expired, especially since these certificates can only protect user data when they're current. So let me just ask you a few questions. When Equifax sought to upgrade its SSL certificates on July 29, 2017, how many expired certificates did your team come across, and how many of the certificates had been expired by more than a day? Uh, Senator, I don't have that information in front of me. If, if you'd like me to, I could ask my chief security officer if he could help with that question. That would be terrific. Thank okay. you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, unfortunately, I also was not at uh, Equifax during the time of this incident, and so I don't have that information uh, with me right this moment. But I'm happy to go back to the team. We'll get. Does the company have that information? I believe we do. Yes. And do you know if any of these certificates had been expired for more than eight months? Uh, unfortunately, because I wasn't there, I don't have the specifics on the certificates exactly. I would expect that even though you weren't there, that you would know this or have access to it because it seems to me that is the type of um, investigation and understanding that you would want to develop moving forward. Senator, if I could just add, uh, yeah. you know, as, as you might imagine, we have a much different process today, much more robust. Uh, we know exactly which certificates are expired, uh, which ones are critical, they're risk rated. Um, we also do uh, automatic scanning right. that is a protocol that would be quite normal in today's environment. And we're always, we're continually investing in new technologies to make sure we even stay in front of that and, right. and are very rapid around uh, uh, addressing those. So you are routinely auditing your SSL certificates now? Yes. I'm seeing nodding too. Okay. Uh, and you're making sure that they're current and they're not in danger of imminently expiring? That's correct. Correct? Okay. Would you support a law that would require companies like Equifax that deal with millions of Americans' personal identifiable information to adhere to clear cybersecurity standards and practices, such as auditing your security certificates on a continuous basis, established standards established by NIST and enforced through your regulator? First, Senator, I, I agree that Equifax is in a unique position with the data we hold versus most companies. Yep. So, you know, we understand that and we take that uh, quite seriously. With regards to uh, all of the elements you talked about, those are standard protocols for us today and things that we're following as a company and, you know, really the highest standards of data security. With regards to legislation, you know, we'd be happy to work with your office and understand, you know, what's a what's the right legislation to move forward, but we're doing the things you talked about. I understand you're doing things, but you're doing things after a major breach, and what I want to make sure is that Americans whose information is in custody of an entity they may not even know anything about uh, don't have to wait for there to be a breach before companies start doing what they should responsibly do. Um, we are, you know, we, we have all discussed that this is an ongoing threat. It's been an ongoing threat now for a while. And uh, we need to make sure that there are standards in place just the way we have safety standards in many other industries. Let me move on just to another aspect to this. It appears from the PSI report that one of Equifax's biggest weaknesses was that the company's policy uh, made individual developers responsible for identifying and patching vulnerabilities in the software they use rather than relying on a full company effort to address any vulnerabilities. And as Senator Carpenter mentioned, unfortunately when DHS alerted Equifax to an urgent and critical vulnerability in a piece of software called Apache Struts, the single developer used the software, who was using the software was not notified by his superiors about DHS's urgent message about those vulnerabilities. As a result, that developer was unaware of a critical vulnerability that eventually was exploited by hackers. You mentioned in your testimony that human error was certainly part of the problems that led to the breach, and I think we've all acknowledged that up here too. However, human error happens at every level of government and every level of the private sector. So it's incumbent upon security professionals and leaders of any security system, government or private sector, to build in extensive redundancies to mitigate against inevitable human errors. So it appears that prior to the breach, Equifax had not built in those redundancies. 
and as a result, human error became a single point of failure in a critical cyber attack. What redundancies has Equifax built into its system to ensure that inevitable human errors never again lead to this kind of breach? Senator, we agree completely with your uh, your uh, summary there that you know a single point of uh, failure is is one too many, which is why we've got a number of redundancies. If the senator is okay, I'd ask uh, my chief security officer yeah, maybe to talk in more detail. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, one of the one of the key tenets of our program is assurance. Um, we want to make sure we have as many layers of security as absolutely possible because we know that any given control may fail or may be bypassed from a sophisticated attacker. As it relates to patching, we've updated all of our processes. We've implemented automated tools to be able to help reduce the reliance on human error. Yep. We've uh, established patch champions, individuals specifically accountable for um, the uh, implementation of these patches across the entire enterprise. And then we have an automated tracking system uh, as well to be able to continue to track and manage these. I would mention one other one. Um, on the back end, what we do is we continuously scan our environment. So we, again, don't just rely on, this, on one system, one process, one individual. We have a belt and suspenders approach across the entire program. Well, thank you. That's helpful. And I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Sorensen, I did have a question for Marriott. I'll submit it for the record. I want us to be thinking about what kind of standards we should have when companies merge uh, that might have, help us uh, make sure that we're getting to problems before they for their breach. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hassan. We look forward to continuing to work with you on, on these issues you raised today and others. I'm going to reclaim some of my time now. I'll be, be back with more uh, to follow up on the points that Senator Hassan made. She talked about updating certificates uh, on the website. She talked about building in redundancies. Um, again, Mr. Begor, you were uh, in your testimony pretty confident that they were doing the right things by saying that the program also leveraged strong administrative and technical safeguards and was subject to regular ongoing review through external and internal assessments. And there is a, a third uh, concern that I have that I think we need to raise this morning and be sure that we're aware of a lack of follow-up, really, to, uh, to an audit that was done. There was a 2015 audit of the security of your system. It found over 8,500 known critical, high, or medium vulnerabilities on Equifax systems. So here's an audit, <laughs> discovers these vulnerabilities. Um, these vulnerabilities had not been patched uh, when the uh, breach occurred, and, and many were over 90 days old. A copy of that audit uh, is there with you on the witness table. I've, I've had it for you all to look at this morning. Um, I'm going to ask that that 2015 audit be made part of the record uh, without objection. So my question for you is, how does a company that at that time, as you indicated, placed a high priority on cybersecurity allow 8,500 vulnerabilities to exist unpatched on its systems? Um, and of course, my follow-up is, since you've become CEO and you stepped in and aggressively tried to address these issues, have you addressed these patching vulnerabilities on Equifax's systems? So how did it? How, how could that have happened? And then what has been done? Yeah, thank you, Senator. And, and as you point out, I wasn't there. I, I spent uh, quite a bit of time looking at uh, the past. I'm a big believer that we want to learn from mistakes and learn from things that weren't going as well as they could be. And uh, I've tried to be quite clear, and I will be clear right now, that there's no question uh, what we did in the past, we can do a lot better today and tomorrow, and we already have. Um, we've made massive changes in our security protocols, our infrastructure. Um, the involvement of the organization, as I mentioned earlier, um, we brought in uh, really top talent. Uh, it starts with people leading these organizations. Uh, I think the uh, senator may know that uh, the CISO reports directly to me, uh, Jamil does, uh, Farsi, uh, and also has a line into the board to our technology committee, which is a, a best practice in, uh, in, in many companies. And, you know, we've, uh, you know, added, uh, doubled the size of his team. With regards to your specific question around uh, audits and patch management, we've also doubled the size of our audit team. And as a new element, uh, we've added uh, IT or cyber experts as a part of our internal audit team. Historically, those were just financial kind of resources. Now we have experienced uh, technologists or security people in our independent audit team that are doing some of that work. And with regards to uh, follow-up of audits, uh, there's Let me, let me just hold, hold there for a second. 
So when you look back at the 8,500 vulnerabilities that were um, reported through that audit, what happened? Why were those vulnerabilities not patched? What was the, what was the issue? You know, Senators, you may imagine uh, there's a large organization like Equifax has uh, many um, uh, patches that are underway at all times. Mm -hmm. You know, they're coming in weekly and daily. And it's the race is never won, as was said earlier by Mr. Sorensen. Yeah, and, and, uh, but and the, you know, but the, the question is, what did you learn from it? In other words, as you look back, I understand yeah. that you have uh, beefed up your uh, cybersecurity presence, and, and you've got the CSO reporting, and you put a bonus system in place that incentivizes uh, all your executives to look at it, but, but what happened? How could those 8,500 vulnerabilities not have been addressed at, the, at that time? What did you learn from that? Well, I, you know, I, I learned from that, Senator, that uh, that's not how you want to operate. You know, we, we don't operate that way today. There's a real focus on, uh, you know, uh, both um, risk prioritizing, the uh, patching that needs to be done, so the most critical areas are done first, the next ones happen after that. There's real follow-up, there's tracking, I think, Mr. Farsi talked about, uh, you know, how we follow up on those. Um, we have automated systems now to track those, but there's a real rigor, as there should be, you know, around ensuring that that work is completed and those vulnerabilities are, uh, are closed down. So that 2015 audit, if it had been followed up on, would have made a difference. Uh, it appears to us, based on our analysis of, of what happened, uh, where are you now? Have you done a recent audit? Are you continuing to audit? We audit routinely. Um, I don't know the... Uh, the last audit, I believe, was done by the internal audit team in the fourth quarter. Um, we also have third parties um, coming in and, and doing work around our cybersecurity efforts. And um, we do our own um, perimeter testing by our own internal team. We also bring in third parties that the team doesn't know is trying to penetrate um, the exterior of our system. So there's all levels of uh, rigor around uh, getting external inputs like audit around uh, our uh, systems and processes. So you've done um, a follow-up audit comparable to that 2015 audit, and you have responded to what has been discovered, because I assume that it also discovered that there were certain vulnerabilities. Correct. You know, you, you want your audit to identify things that will make the system better. You know, that's the way I think about audit teams. And um, the uh, I don't know how many audits have been done since the cyber breach in 2017, and I can follow up with your office on the number of audits around this area, but there have been numerous. And as you might know, um, there's also regulatory organizations, CFPB, the Attorney Generals, and others that uh, are uh, involved in discussions with us around audits, as well as our customers um, yep. are doing audits. Well, our us. answer is to, is to figure out, you know, what the heck happened? How could you have an audit that, uh, again, uncovers these vulnerabilities and not act on it. And with regard to legislation we're looking at, you know, what role should audits play? If you could provide that to the subcommittee, that would be very helpful when your last audit was, uh, any results of the audit, how you react to it today. Uh, that would be much appreciated. Senator Rosen. Thank you. I want to thank you for bringing this uh, very important issue, privacy and security. It is issue number one, not just for all of us as individuals, but for all the companies and businesses that serve us, that we expect to protect us and our communities um, every single day. But I want to address, uh, I, I do have some things to talk about acquisition and data migration. As a former uh, software developer, I've actually done that in my prior life, so uh, I have some comments on that. But first, I want to talk about the global nature, Mr. Sorensen, about uh, Marriott Hotels. Of course, you're worldwide. Um, you operate in all 50 U.S. states and in 130 countries and territories. Americans stay at Marriott Hotels all over the world, so it is crucial that our data collected is secure. Of course, you've noted yourself approximately 23 million passports possibly been compromised no matter where the hotel um, has been physically located. So my question to you is, um, last year, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo stated publicly that China was responsible for the cyber attack on your Marriott system and theft of consumer data. Do you believe that to be the case? First, good morning, Senator Rosen. Thank you. Uh, nice, to, nice to be here and to be able to answer your questions. Uh, the the uh, short answer is we don't know. Uh, and I feel quite inadequate about even uh, drawing inferences from the information that we've uh, obtained. We have, uh, when we first discovered information had been extracted from the system, which was November 19th, 
it has been all hands on deck, basically, to make sure that so we So no preliminary data has come out as to where the ISPs may be located or uh, any commonalities in, in uh, other hacks, other hacking attempts with other companies across the uh, world? We have, we have shared everything we have with the FBI, including the, the addresses used and uh, the, t the malware tools used in the system so that they can uh, do the, that kind of investigation. We've simply been focused on making sure the door is closed and communicating with our customers. And so do you have policies here in the U.S. that apply abroad, taking into account, obviously, uh, foreign laws and regulations? Uh, we do. We have policies, uh, certainly, about uh, data collection and retention. Uh, we also have an obligation to comply with local law. I think one of the things that's unusual about the Marriott cyber attack is this passport uh, information. Uh, and the numbers. How, how long do you retain the passport information? Well, the, the, the passport information that was accessed, again, was in the Starwood Reservation System, uh, and it had been there for a number of years. Do you have a responsibility when you buy a company to do an audit of the company that you're either buying, or I guess it's like buying a home, isn't it? Do you get an inspection? What does the seller disclose? What does the buyer's responsibility? Did you buy it as is? And uh, so you just... It took no method of auditing the data coming across? Well, we, uh, in the bottom line is we do buy it as is. When you're acquiring a public company and ultimately buy those shares, there's nobody left as a seller anymore. We, we are Starwood today as well as Marriott. Uh, but of course we did diligence. We had... But who maintains... So I want to tell you, as a former computer programmer, I've worked for companies where I've done this acquisition and data migration. And while the other system is still up, I had a team of people working with me to maintain that system, auditing that system, making sure it had integrity while we were training and moving that data over. Right. So where was your responsibility in maintaining and as you migrated, protecting that data? We, we were very much taking the same approach. So even th really three periods we could look at separately. One is the three and a half week due diligence period before we signed documents to acquire Starwood. Very abbreviated, uh, public company to public company. That was a, you know, tell, tell us about your IT system. Our IT team was involved in that and asking questions. But it was quite brief and, and uh, we didn't learn about any of this. Second period is between uh, the fall of 2015 and the fall of 2016, between signing and closing the transaction. And while we had not closed, our team, our IT team was deeply engaged in understanding Starwood system, understanding the data, understanding the vulnerabilities, and being ready essentially for the moment the transaction closed to say, okay, now what are we gonna do with this system, both from a cybersecurity perspective mm -hmm data retention perspective, but also an operating perspective, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and then immediately after closing, it was bringing in not just our internal expertise, but external expertise and saying, help us identify the risks in this system. Let's make sure we are doing things to address those risks and enhance them. In retrospect, we wish we had done even more. Obviously, so something happened. But, but even while that system is running independently before the data migration and before it's right. turned off, we are very much trying to make sure that we are addressing the security flaws that we think are there. So as we think about those 23 million passports and other data that may have been breached worldwide, um, do you have, of course, I just want to be sure, a consistent policy, of course, taking into um, consideration uh, certain other government's laws or regulations for how you keep the data, how you retain the data, and your responsibility towards the data? So let me give you just a couple of data uh, points here, if I could. Um, my number is just a little <coughs> bit different than the committee's. Uh, about 19 million total passports. 19, 23. Access. It's a big it, number. It's, it's an awful lot it's of numbers. It's a big number. It's an awful lot of passports. About 5 million of those were unencrypted. Uh, and that makes it better? No, no, no. That, th <laughs> those, are the, those are the ones that obviously would have been most And successful. so we know that hackers can beat the encryption. So that isn't really a factor here, I don't believe. Sir. Well, I, I, I actually do think part of our strategy going forward is to rely on encryption and tokenization to say whatever data we keep in this uh, space, for example, it should all be encrypted. That by itself is not uh, necessarily a totally adequate defense, but it is one of the tools we should use. I think one of the other things that uh, is clear, there are dozens of countries around the world that require us to collect passport data. Sometimes they require us to make physical copies of passports mm -hmm. for guests in those hotels. 
in the Marriott system legacy that was done <coughs> at the hotel level and not centralized in a data uh, mm -hmm. uh, platform, if you will. Uh, in the Starwood system, it was done locally and then essentially centralized into the data system. There are pros and cons of allowing it to be entirely at property level. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pros is it's a smaller target, That's if right. you will. Uh, one of the cons it's may more be... more diffuse, harder to get more diffuse. centralized, much That's easier right. to break into uh, and one bigger of the con reward. One of the cons, on the other hand, is then if each hotel needs the same elaborate system of uh, cyber defenses, can, can you make sure that you're delivering that? And th those are issues we're working through right now. Uh, we, I think uh, uh, in all likelihood, everything, passports will be encrypted. Uh, secondly, I think we'll look very hard at not centralizing any of it, uh, but making sure that we've got appropriate tools at property level to, to protect against uh, cyber attacks. And perhaps how long you store customer information, sensitive information like their credit card numbers and, and uh, those extra security codes. That, we are looking at that too, absolutely. Thank you. I think my time's up. Thank you, Senator, Senator Holly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, and ranking member, thank you for having this uh, important hearing. Uh, thank you, witnesses, for being here. Mr. McGor, let me start with you. Um, you may know that uh, as Attorney General of Missouri, I and 43 other attorneys general uh, sent, uh, launched a multi-state action after the uh, announcement of the Equifax breach in 2017, and among other things, we sent a letter uh, to Equifax, in which we expressed particularly con particular concern with Equifax's post-breach activities, including the offering of a fee-based service uh, to uh, uh, guard against data breach at the same time that you were offering a free service. Here's from the letter. We object to Equifax using its own data breach as an opportunity to sell services to breach victims. Selling a fee-based product that competes with Equifax's own free offer of credit monitoring services to victims of Equifax's own data breach is unfair, particularly if consumers are not sure if their information was compromised. Can you give us the update on the status of this product? Are you still doing that? Uh, uh, Senator, uh, thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony this morning, we offered a free product for all Americans, whether they were impacted or not at the time of the data breach. And then uh, I don't know the exact timing of when we stopped um, marketing to consumers, but uh, soon after the data breach, it may have been um, when we received the letter from you and the other attorney generals, we stopped marketing uh, to U.S. consumers um, as a result of uh, that. We recently started again um, marketing in October on a very limited basis. Um, the other thing that we offered uh, in January of 2000. This is a free product, though, that you said that you were, you were marketing a free product. No, uh, Senator, we, um, we, when, when the breach happened, uh, we offered a free credit monitoring product to any American. And it was opened up to any American could get that, whether they were impacted by the data breach or not. That happened in uh, uh, September of 2017. In January of 2018, we added another free product for any American that's free for life, that's a lock and alert product, where on your mobile device, you can lock your credit file or unlock it. And that's, Equifax is the only credit bureau offering that. And then last, uh, you talked about uh, marketing um, to consumers. We stopped marketing in the, uh, I don't know the exact date, I can come back to your office, but in the fourth quarter of 2017, to U.S. consumers. What, what about the fee-based product, however, that you were offering after the announcement of the breach? And that's what I was referring to, Senator. We stopped that in the uh, fourth quarter of 2000. You stopped marketing it. That's correct. In the fourth quarter. Okay. Um, we raised a number of other concerns, the Attorney General, in that, in that same letter and in that same multi-state action, including the terms of service that required c customers to waive their <coughs> rights, charges customers pay for a security freeze uh, with other credit monitoring companies, uh, and uh, overly long wait times for the Equifax Customer Support Call Center. Can you give us an update on how you've addressed these concerns? Yes, Senator. Um, you know, on the, uh, on, the, on the freezing your credit file, I referred to what Equifax proactively did in January of 2018, uh, offering a free freeze or lock product uh, to any American, and that's still offered today. You could get that today. I have it on my phone. It allows you to lock or unlock your credit file at no charge and free for life. It is, as the Senator also knows, last September, um, the Senate passed uh, 21, uh, Senate Bill 2155 that offers consumers free freezes for life. That was passed and that's in place and we've implemented that along with the uh, other three credit bureaus. 
With regards to our customer service center, there was clearly some challenges there as I look back on what happened in the fourth quarter. Um, staffing up uh, for something like this is uh, quite challenging. Uh, in my testimony this morning, I talked about the uh, incremental $50 million of investment we're making now in our customer service capabilities to enhance our abilities to uh, manage uh, our day-to-day -day interactions with consumers, as well as investing to make it easier for consumers to interact with us when they have a question outside of a data breach, but just in their normal day-to-day -day activities um, with the Credit Bureau, whether it's around a dispute or a question on their uh, file. Thank you. Mr. Sorensen, uh, in the testimony you provided, the written testimony you provided to this committee, you noted, I'm going to make sure I get this right, you noted that you've not received any substantiated claims of loss from fraud attributable to the incident and that none of the security firms that you'd engaged to monitor the dark web have found evidence that information contained in the affected tables has been or is being offered for sale and that you'd not been notified by any banks or credit card networks that Starwood had been identified as a common point of purchase in any fraudulent transactions. Do you take this to be a thorough accounting of which sources might know about your customers' data uh, used by third parties? And is it sufficient for you just to wait for them to report to you? I think the answer, certainly the first question is no. It's, it's hard to feel like anything is thorough in this space. Uh, you, you pick up uh, signals from a number of different places. We use a number of different tools, for example, to try and go after the same thing. Uh, we take some comfort in this, but it's only some comfort. And uh, I think we are grateful for the partnerships we have with the financial institutions so we can have a little bit of that dialogue about what they might be seeing. Uh, but we are, you know, one, one of the reasons we put the Web Watcher out and made available to our customers is that it's another tool uh, to look regularly at the so-called dark web to see whether a particular customer's information is showing up on that dark web. If, if I could just press a little deeper here, does, does this, in your written testimony, does this reflect an ad hoc list of sources that could report this information about personal information uh, of users, or does this reflect some sort of cybersecurity methodology that you have in place uh, in order to uh, protect your consumer's data? No, I, I don't. I don't think this is uh, really in the first instance about protecting consumers' data. I think it is about assessing what we can assess about the cyber breach that occurred. Uh, and so if, if you will, the, the attack uh, happened, successful I suppose, if you take it from the attacker's perspective. Information was obtained. We've been wrestling with the consequences of that. One of the tools that we're using is to try and figure out, okay, what can we tell about where that data has ended up. The tools that we use to protect the data in the first place, I think, are uh, uh, different and, and in, in many respects, obviously, much more fundamentally important because we want to avoid that data from getting out in the first instance at all. It, and you do have some cybersecurity methodology that you've now put in place to systematically protect uh, your consumer's data. That's what you're telling me. A, a whole range of tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you, uh, f my final question here, uh, Mr. Chairman, are, are you complying with GDPR, Mr. Sorensen? I mean, I understand that the GDPR in Europe requires reporting within 72 hours if at least one Marriott customer resides in the EU. Is, is that your understanding as well? Yes, and we believe we are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Senator Harris. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, bringing this subject up. As California's AG um, supported expanding California's laws as it relates to the requirement of the report of data breaches, and have met with many folks over the years who have suffered greatly because of the breach of, of their personal um, information and data. And so the risks are obviously many. Um, Mr. Burgor, Equifax is facing lawsuits from consumers whose information was affected by the breach. In response, um, your lawyers have argued that even though their information was stolen, consumers cannot prove that they were harmed. It was recently reported that none of the data stolen from Equifax in 2017 has been used in identity theft or other fraudulent activity and that the stolen data has not been offered for sale on the dark web. Do those um, assertions remain true? They do, Senator Harris. Uh, you know, to date, uh, we use a, a variety of outside experts as well as our own, uh, like uh, Marriott, uh, really trying to understand where the data went, what it was used for, and our analysis is that there's uh, 
been no evidence that the data has been sold uh, or no evidence of increased identity theft as a result of Equifax data that was stolen in 2017. So a former senior intelligence official recently told CNBC that the hack was more likely the work of a foreign intelligence agency than a garden variety criminal, um, which would explain why the stolen information has not been used for garden variety crimes. If a foreign power is, and especially a hostile foreign power, is using the data it stole from Equifax to target U.S. officials or American operatives, does it remain your position that there has been no injury or harm caused by this breach? Uh, uh, Senator, we don't know who took the data, and we still don't, and we're working closely with the FBI. Uh, you know, days after identifying um, the uh, cyber breach in 2017, we started collaboratively working with the FBI and other authorities. Um, we have the same goal. We've been in compl in completely transparent about who took the data, and we just don't know who it is at this, point, this stage, and we continue to work with those authorities. It'd be important for us to know that you appreciate the fact that if the data were breached for the purposes of gaining information about U.S. officials or American operatives, that there would most certainly be harm and damage and injury that would result from that. Do you appreciate that concern? Of course, Senator. In my testimony this morning, I started out by expressing regret you know, for what happened, uh, talked about what we're doing for consumers, which is really our initial focus and continues to be our focus around, you know, supporting consumers, the free um, credit monitoring that we offered, the other free products that we've rolled out uh, subsequent to the data breach, you know, around supporting consumers. And do you understand that there have been targeted um, uh, violations of, of privacy as it relates to employees of the United States government and that there is a concern among the intelligence community and all of us that there is a focused um, concern and actually a triangulation um, around officials and American officials and in particular those who may be involved in our military or in our intelligence work um, and the attempt being to get their personal information for the purposes of attempt to compromise those individuals. Are you aware of that concern? I, I've read about it and I've listened to the experts that we work with about that uh, threat on uh, American companies and on American consumers and as well as government employees. And will you commit to this committee that you will have that as a priority among your priorities in understanding and thinking about the potential harm that has resulted from these breaches? Uh, Senator, uh, you know, I've testified a couple times this morning that uh, security is a very is a top priority at Equifax today. We've doubled our security team. We're so spending. is that yes? The answer is everything we're doing is around yes. Okay, great. And um, Mr. Sorensen, as um, Senator Rosen referenced, in November of 2018, hackers exposed the personal information of up to 383 million Marriott customers, including millions of passport numbers, shortly after cybersecurity firms and recently our government hired was hired to assess the damage attributed um, to the hack um, and attributed it to Chinese intelligence. In addition to passport numbers, could hackers have accessed guest itineraries and the names of their traveling companions? Yes, we th well, traveling companions I'm not, I'm not certain about, but uh, reservation data was obtained uh, in, um, I think most recently, as far as we can tell, in 2016. Uh, so that would have been uh, my, re my upcoming reservation or perhaps a past reservation that I had uh, had at one of the Starwood hotels. We do not think, based on what we've been able to tell so far, that any reservation data post-2016 uh, was obtained by the uh, cyber attacker. So in the 2018 uh, instance, which was the first one after we acquired Starwood, we do not think in individual reservation data was there. Uh, th this is not... 100% uh, provable, but we believe that that means there's no longer any upcoming reservation data which was obtained. Because if 2016, two years ago, we don't, we tend not to take reservations more than a year out. Uh, so, so probably nothing that is still, uh, if, if you will, a future reservation. And then as it relates to the names of traveling companions, it, it is the custom of, of Marriott hotels to collect the information of whoever is occupying the room, whoever has the credit card plus 
whatever guest may, they may have. Isn't that correct? Well, it, uh, it, again, this is the Starwood Reservation database. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, certainly in many instances, a hotel would note uh, somebody else who might be sharing a room, but not necessarily in every instance. If the person who made the reservation is showing up and checking in and getting the key, uh, the front desk may or may not uh, take the time to make the effort to figure out whether a spouse or a child or somebody else was traveling with them. But certainly it would have happened in some, some circumstances. So th for those folks whose names may have been um, exposed, but they are not actually the individual who's contracted with the hotel to, to pay for the room, have those people been notified of this breach? Well, we, we tried uh, very hard to notify everybody that we could. Uh, the, the first tool we used, of course, was a broad press release with broad public dissemination and then the, the uh, carrying on the, the banner, if you will, the top line of the Marriott.com, Starwood.com apps, all the rest of it. Uh, in addition, we sent out um, in excess of 50, e 50 million emails uh, to folks that we had email addresses on to, to also make sure that we were uh, notifying them in that way. Uh, is it possible that, it, that somebody has slipped through the cracks? Of course. I think the more likely that they were repeat customers of ours, the more likely they are travelers, uh, uh, the more likely that they would have been either notified by us directly or seen the news. And then, Mr. Chairman, just one last question, and it's a brief question. Is it correct that Marriott is the top hospitality provider for the American government and the United States military? Uh, I don't know that we have the data which would tell us that. We are the uh, largest hotel company by rooms. Uh, Can you follow up the with world. the committee and, and see if you may have the answer to that question? I'll, I'll ask to see whether we can find out. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Harris. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our uh, witnesses uh, today. Uh, Mr. Begor, uh, if a, a consumer is delinquent uh, on a payment but later makes the necessary payment uh, to bring the account current, it's my understanding that that delinquency stays on the credit report for seven years. Is, is that correct? Yes, it is, Senator. So if a, a consumer misses a single credit card payment and then follows, uh, 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 you will continue to follow them for basically seven years, and then they're going to have an opportunity to, in that seven years, basically demonstrate that they are a good credit risk, uh, a good credit uh, uh, score, and as a result of that, then get additional credit as a result of that after that seven-year period. Is that correct? If there isn't any other activity? It, the, there isn't, Senator. Um, but as you may know, in the credit scoring models that we use, um, other credit bureaus use, the banks use themselves as a delinquent payment, using your example, if there was one delinquent payment, as that ages out, it becomes less predictive and right. it has right. less impact on an individual's credit score or ability to uh, obtain credit. But it's still, it's the expectation it takes seven years. You want to watch it for seven years, basically, just to see how it acts. Obviously, there's a, a slope there. And, and, I, and I bring that up because I think that most people, certainly everybody that I talk to, believes that Equifax uh, was beyond being just delinquent on, on one payment when it came to the securing of this critical data and this cyber security hack. Uh, and that the information that has now been put out or could have been taken uh, will likely be there forever. Uh, and in fact, the f that you haven't seen some of these activities in the short run may make sense because if you're a bad actor, you may wait a while before you actually use this data to, to uh, use it for nefarious uh, purposes. And so I just find it kind of interesting in that delinquent payments for a consumer uh, you follow uh, for seven years, uh, although you've offered the, uh, the credit freeze for a lifetime, when it comes to credit monitoring, it's only two years. And credit monitoring is certainly much more preferable to consumer convenience uh, than it is to freeze and to unfreeze, go back and forth. And I know you want to build consumer trust, uh, but if you're telling your consumers, uh, we'll watch you for seven years because you've missed one payment, but we had this massive breach and we gave all your personal information, somebody got all your personal information to millions of people and it's going to, it's going to be out there for the rest of your life, but we'll help you for two years. It seems to me that uh, it would make sense that at a minimum that you would offer credit, credit uh, monitoring for the seven years just as you monitor your customers for seven years. So my question to you, Mr. Begar, would you, would you support mandating cre free credit reporting for seven years for all consumers whose personally identifying information was the subject of a breach of a credit reporting 
agency? Uh, Senator, you know, we think that's really situational on what the consumer should be offered. Uh, we offered uh, 12 months uh, starting in uh, uh, the fourth quarter of 2017. We voluntarily extended it uh, for another 12 months uh, uh, early or late last year. Um, we'll continue to look at that as we go forward. And, uh, and again, uh, it's, it's my view that legislation is not required um, for that, that we're doing the right thing for consumers. And, and I would just remind the Senator that um, while the credit monitoring is a valuable product, um, what the Senate passed uh, last September in, 20, in Senate Bill 2155, offering a free freeze for consumers, really is the most important way to protect your data. And then Equifax has a supplement product that's uh, available on your phone or mobile device that's free for life um, to uh, do the same thing with some more functionality. So if you're at a car dealership uh, and getting an auto loan, you can unlock your credit file. And then when you finish getting that financial transaction, you can lock it again. No one can see that data it, once it's either frozen by Senate Bill 2155 or locked by our uh, free for life product. But you still see the value of monitoring because you're offering it to your customers for up to, to two years. Uh, that that's a, a better product for folks than just the freeze and unfreeze, which is more cumbersome. But I think you mentioned that at the beginning. So my question is, what you, you said you'll you'll reevaluate this on a situational basis. What is that situational basis? What's the criteria you'll be using as to whether or not to extend this beyond the two years? Uh, Senator, it really depends on you know how the data you know how we can see the data has been used and what it's being used for. Is uh, I think some of the criteria we take into effect, and I and I would make the point where credit monitoring is quite valuable. Um, you know, we believe that uh, giving consumers control about who has access to the data, when it's frozen, no one can see it. And, uh, you know, no one has access to it. I'd like to, in the remaining time, touch briefly on a, another important subject, and that's uh, the collecting of data on, on minors. Uh, how many minors uh, had their personally identified information compromised in the 2017 breach? Uh, Senator, I don't uh, have that information in front of me. I'd be happy to get back to your office with that. Is it greater than zero? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, Senator. Uh, how, uh, so you, you'll, you'll provide that uh, for yes. me? Yes. That would be great. Do you have any policies regarding the collection of information on minors? It, the policy is that, uh, you know, we don't. Um, and as you know, you may know Senate Bill 2155, uh, you know, allows a uh, parent to uh, put a freeze on their uh, children's um, credit file if in fact they have one um, and uh, we're quite diligent about managing that because it's an area of focus by uh, um, imposters or fraudulent uh, individuals that try to create a credit file for identity theft purposes not only on minors but other Americans. Well is there any instance where a young child uh, would need a non-frozen account? Not to my knowledge Senator. But a parent has to opt out, even though there's no reason to have a non or to have a frozen account. But the, the parent has to be active in doing that. Okay. So last year, I worked to pass legislation that protects children from synthetic ID fraud. It's a form of identity uh, theft that I know you know very well, uh, where stolen security numbers and of children are paired with fake names and birth dates to apply for loans, credit cards, and other accounts. Could any minor's uh, uh, information that was exposed in the 2017 breach be used as part of identity theft or synthetic ID fraud operation? Uh, Senator, I'll have to get back to you on, uh, you know, what minors were included, if, if any. I, I don't know the answer to it in the uh, theft that took place in 2017. Great. Well, I appreciate working with you on that. Thank you. We have a, a short second round here. Senator Carver, do you have additional questions? Both, uh, both Equifax and Marriott publicly announced their data breaches within weeks of learning them. And while this is better than some companies have done in recent years, as you know, it's uh, a lot longer than, for example, Target waited when it suffered a breach in 2013. A, in fact, uh, Target learned about a cyber attack, you may recall, affecting uh, its customers in the middle of the holiday shopping center. I was one of them. And uh, that year and informed the Justice Department and the public in, literally within days. And this allowed target customers to take precautions against fraud and identity theft and to monitor the bank and credit card statements. Mr. Bigor, uh, the, the hackers who attacked uh, Equifax were in the company network for 78 days before Equifax discovered their presence. I think that's, that's correct. And by the time Equifax informed the public, consumers' information had been in the hands of hackers for close to four months. Given the damage that can be done with the type of information Equifax collects, um, why do you suppose the folks who are 
in, in positions of responsibility prior to your arrival. Why wait uh, six weeks to step forward? Uh, why not uh, follow the uh, target example so that people could take swift action to protect themselves as soon as possible? And if I'd been you coming into a new uh, situation as the new CEO, I would have said to the people who were there before me, what were you thinking? <laughs> How could you have allowed this to happen? Uh, did you ever have those kind of conversations? Uh, Senator, I had a lot of conversations when I joined last April, as you might imagine, and I hope you get a sense for the uh, pace of change, the uh, breadth of change, the uh, priority around security. Um, there's a whole new team here. Um, we've added extensive resources, and we're very serious about security. With regards to uh, the time frame, you know, with a data breach, you know, my strategy, and I believe it was the team strategy at the time, was to be accurate and quick in, in, uh, in completing the work. Um, as the Senator probably knows, it's a very complex process. Um, once you find out that you have a data breach to really determine you know, which elements of your database was affected, uh, we brought in the very best forensic experts um, within days of the data breach. Uh, I think it was a day or two, uh, contacted the FBI and got their involvement in it. And from my look back at what the team did, uh, they moved as quickly as they could to ensure that we were going to be complete and accurate. You know, from my perspective, uh, you know, making an announcement that there was a data breach, but not knowing which Americans were impacted, and is it 50 million, 2 million, 150 million, it took time to really do the forensics to figure that out. My approach is to be accurate and complete with a real focus around the consumer first. You know, really making sure that those consumers that are impacted, we can identify who they are and then communicate with them quickly. Mr. Um, Mr. Sorensen, really the same question. I would like to hear from, from you about the factors that went into Marriott's decision on the timing of its public notice. So we, we had an uh, alert which on September 7, 2018 uh, was triggered. Uh, that alert went to a third party who was operating the reservation system for us. Uh, with, in effect, a copy to, to the IT group at Marriott. Uh, we heard from uh, that third-party operator the next day on September 8th that that alert had been received and immediately started to mobilize resources to uh, contain and to uh, ascertain why that alert went off. Uh, it wasn't until November 19th, uh, 2018, that we learned that data about our customers had been exfiltrated from our system. Uh, and we announced uh, publicly 11 days later on November 30th. Uh, we, of course, had lawyers and security experts and all sorts of other folks who were engaged in the conversation about uh, uh, timing, how, how quickly could we go. Uh, we also uh, wanted to make sure that we had set up call centers and websites so that the moment we uh, released this information publicly, the customers had a place to go. Uh, and uh, find out more and sign up for the web watcher services and do the other things that were necessary. And so that 11-day that time, of course, was, was uh, met the legal requirements, but it also uh, was practically about as fast as we could move it uh, and, and be able to communicate something which was concrete and useful to customers and then be able to deliver uh, something of what we anticipated they would, they would need and want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me just ask uh, both of you, any idea, uh, do you have any sense for how many state data breach notification laws your companies are, uh, I guess, uh, subject to? Or would it be fair to, fair to say there may be even 50 uh, such state laws that you're subject to at this time? It, uh, if it's okay, Senator, I'll go first. Uh, you're correct on that, and it's quite a challenge. Uh, in I was going to ask, what kind of challenge does that present, if it's true? You know, there, there's... I don't know if the exact number is 50, but they're all different. And it creates challenges in a situation like Equifax is perhaps Marriott's too in complying with the requirements. You know, there's different uh, notification documents that are required. There's different ways you communicate with the consumer. There's different ways you're allowed to communicate with the consumer. And, you know, we've been uh, longstanding supporters of a unified um, federal legislation that would unify that and uh, allow you know, actually that's one of the elements that makes it, there's a time element of there. Once you figure out which consumers are impacted, then what states are they in, and there's requirements on how you communicate with them. Um, we, we're very supportive of a uh, federal um, unified legislation on that. Thank you. Same question, uh, Mr. Sergeant. Um, 
What kind of challenges do you have uh, with respect to who to notify, when to notify, what to disclose about a data breach? The, with 50 uh, different states. It, it was not. Uh, it was not among the biggest challenges we faced. I, I would put it that way. Although, I, if if memory serves, we found uh, someplace between 20 and 30 states had specific notification requirements with a uh, with a deadline. Now, uh, we of course met those deadlines and then ultimately communicated to all 50 uh, states. Uh, outside the United States, there were probably. I don't know, 20 or 30 countries that had uh, various kinds of notification deadlines. Obviously, that's not nothing that the federal government can uh, can do with that. Uh, sadly, I suppose, in some respects, this ground is too well trod, and so are, there are folks that can help us figure out where those requirements are and how to meet them. Uh, it would be simpler, of course, to have one sort of U.S. Uh, standard. Uh, but you know that's uh, that's something that uh, we'd be happy to work with your office and and give whatever input we could from the experience we've had, mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. I'm sitting here thinking, um, believe it or not, of something Richard Nixon, of all people, once said. And uh, uh, Richard Nixon once said, "The uh, the only uh, people who don't make mistakes are people who don't do anything." And so we all make mistakes. And I've said uh, to our sons now, 29 and 30 years old, and I've said to them many times, "Nothing wrong with making a mistake." The key is just we don't want to continue making the same mistake. In this case, mistakes not are, are harm your companies, but as we've talked about, they harm 150 uh, really innocent uh, people across uh, across this country. So the question is, uh, what do we do about it? And you've talked to us today about a number of things that uh, each of you have done. And, uh, and I uh, am uh, uh, pleased to hear the uh, the uh, statements of uh, apology of contrition, acknowledging the the harm and the damage that's been done, and the, uh, to uh, I uh, God knows I wish and I'm sure 148 million people wish that the kind of thinking of this uh, actions that you've displayed in the last year or so that you've been in your position, Mr. Begor, that 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 kind of thinking had existed in the previous administration, if uh, if you will. You talked about. Um, what I think is really important, leadership's most important in greeting the success of any organization I've ever been a part of, and business, government, military, always the key. And if the, the leader doesn't say cybersecurity is important, or the board doesn't say cybersecurity is important, nobody else down the line is going to make it important in the end. And it, it, is, it, is, it appears to us that you've done that, both of you, and it's made it very clear right from the top this is important. You've aligned incentives financial incentives for the folks who are helping to run your company so that their incentives are all lined up with that in mind. Sounds like you've done a lot with respect to hiring the kind of workforce that you need to enable uh, the, the desires and the wishes of the directives from the, on top to make sure that they're uh, carried out. One of the things that I think a lot about, Mr. Chairman, is uh, workforce, I know you do too, and we have uh, focused in, in Delaware for a number of years now, University of Delaware, Delaware State University, Wilmington University, Delaware Technical Community College, and we're trying to make sure that we are turning out a better workforce to help you know, take on these all these jobs that are, that are available out here to, to, to be done. With the, with the federal government, what our responsibilities are, I was privileged to chair this uh, this uh, committee, Homeland Security Committee, for for a while, and uh, led it with uh, a fellow named Tom Coburn from from Oklahoma. And we focused as a committee, as Senator Portman knows, he's part of this, and uh, on what we needed to do within the, the federal government. What do we need to do as as legislators? And frankly, in those years, those couple of years, we did a lot. And we've continued to do a number of, of things. And I, I really think, Mr. Chairman, that this is a, a, a ripe time for us as a committee. We have new, uh, new talent on either end of us here, Democrat, Republican, bright people with a, a real world experience that can bring a lot to, to this. I think it's really a, an ideal time for us to do uh, our job of oversight. And so we've done all this legislating and it's being implemented. And, and we have, uh, let's find out to what effect, to what good. And I, I would, that's a big part of our job. Last thing I'll say is, is I'd ask the enter for the record some newspaper articles I read on the train coming down this morning uh, from the last uh, several weeks about the uh, uh, dramatic increases in uh, attacks from China and from, uh, from Iran. And uh, I remember when uh, Barack Obama met with the, uh, President Xi 
in uh, Washington State. You may remember this was 2015. I think it was September of 2015. And uh, Jay Johnson, who was the Secretary of Homeland Security, gave me this eyewitness account. And in that meeting, President Obama apparently said to President Xi, we know you're attacking us, and we know that you're coming after our trade secrets, you know we're coming after our business secrets, our scientific, our, uh, our uh, military secrets, and we want you to stop. President Xi apparently said, no, we don't do that, that's not the policy of our country, that's not what we're about. And, and uh, President Obama basically said, this is who's doing it, this is where they're located, and we want you to stop. President Xi said, no, we're not really doing that. And, and I'm told that President Obama said, look, if you don't stop, you'll wish you had, essentially in so many words. And you, as you may recall, dramatic drop in attacks by, uh, by China. About two months before that, uh, the Congress, the United States, the President had uh, essentially signed off on a five-nation deal with Iran. They called for gradually lifting sanctions. At the time, uh, Iran and uh, elements were unrelentingly attacking, uh, especially our financial services company. But um, in uh, July, we, and there was a, our strong supporter of lifting the sanctions in return for the Iranians stopping their development of nuclear weapons and uh, opening up to incredible, uh, very intrusive inspections, and they're still ongoing. And, to the, and you know what happened? Well, literally within a month, the, the frequency of Iranian attacks greatly dropped, almost like China a couple of months later. And so uh, there's, another, there's another element here, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, we don't think much about. And it's, it's, there's so much that they can do, so much that other countries, uh, companies can do and need to do. It's work for us to do in terms of preparing, preparing the workforce and making sure they're available. There's stuff that we can do in our oversight role. But there's also a role here for uh, the administration and in, in reaching out to other, to other countries and getting them to, uh, to work with us instead of being out there undermining what we're trying to do. So there's plenty of work to do, multi-layer approach, and uh, we appreciate your uh, being here today, helping put uh, a spotlight on this, letting us know what you've done to clean up the messes that, uh, that you inherited, especially at Equifax. And it's given us an opportunity to think of ourselves what, what to how we can do uh, better do our own jobs. So thank you. Because everything we do, everything I do, I know we can do better, and it, it certainly includes this. Thank you. I can't believe government could do anything better than it's doing. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, to the witnesses, I've got two follow-up questions here that uh, we want to get into the record. Uh, but let me uh, reiterate what I said earlier, which is you know, we appreciate your being here. We're trying to learn. And the lessons that uh, you have learned within your companies are really important for what we're trying to do legislatively, understanding what happened, what could be done differently. Um, this was frightening, scary, for hundreds of millions of families whose personal and financial data was compromised, you know, through the two companies you now lead. And uh, I appreciate the fact that you acknowledge that, understand that, you know, this is about hackers, it's about technology, but it's ultimately about people. <laughs> and uh, the the frustration that many Americans have right now that uh, nothing is sacred or safe, you know, and um, it, is, it is good to know that, as Mr. Sorensen has said, uh, and Mr. Bigler has said, that some of this data apparently has not been used yet by criminals in ways that one might have thought it could have been. Um, it doesn't mean it didn't happen or isn't happening right now. Uh, also, as raised earlier, you know, some of this may be being used by foreign actors in ways that's uh, counter to our national interests uh, by targeting individuals. Um, so it's really important that we get to the bottom of what happened, what's being done, and what can be done in the future legislatively. Let me go back, if I could, to the cybersecurity protocols, uh, Mr. Bigor, we talked about earlier. And again, in your testimony, uh, you seem to uh, lean a little bit heavily, I thought, on the fact that the program at the time, as I said, leveraged strong administrative and technical safeguards and was subject to regular ongoing review, external and internal assessments. We talked about the audit that was not respected, despite, you know, some really troubling data it, it uncovered. The other part that I think we need to talk about this morning that, and I was waiting to hear what my colleagues were going to address, and they addressed a lot of this, but is the IT inventory. And uh, the investigation, as you know, found that Equifax at the time failed to follow this basic practice of maintaining an IT inventory of applications and assets on its systems. 
And without having this list, uh, Equifax was not able to find the application that was vulnerable and exploited by the hackers. And that's the one that's been talked about previously called Apache Struts. Uh, you guys didn't even have it on your inventory, and so you, you, you couldn't find it. Uh, so I guess a few questions. One, since the breach, has Equifax generated a comprehensive list of applications on its systems? We have, we have, Chairman, in, uh, in great detail, and it's not only that. I think uh, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Farsi, talked about uh, some of the other automated um, systems that we put in place to really track all of our systems and, and make sure we understand not only the systems and all the assets that we have, um, but also when there's a uh, patch that needs to be completed, those are all automated and we're watching those. And then there's multi-layers of defense. You know, it's more than just one, one layer. I think the chairman knows that, that, uh, you know, all these elements have to be done very well and done, uh, you know, with the latest technology, which is what we put in place and we're continuing to put in place. Mm -hmm. um, the National Institute of Science and Technology, NIST, has now issued a recommendation that there be an IT inventory uh, in every company that could be affected uh, by these breaches. Uh, let me ask you this, if Equifax had kept an up-to-date IT inventory, would that have been helpful to have identified the vulnerability? You know, my, my analysis of what happened, uh, you know, in 2017, that there was an inventory. It wasn't as complete as it should be. And, you know, certainly the protocols and the procedures and the resources we have in place are uh, at the highest standards. And, you know, like most companies, uh, we follow the NIST protocols. And uh, as I mentioned earlier this morning, Chairman, that, you know, we have third parties um, actually auditing us against those NIST standards as a part of our uh, many layers of uh, how we're managing our security pro program going forward. Yeah, you know, we have a different opinion on that. You know, our investigation um, identified that there was not a complete inventory. Mr. Farshi, maybe you um, can respond to this, but d was, was there an inventory or not? And did that affect the ability to find the vulnerability? Certainly. Um, so uh, inventory is an important control across any organization to defend against the threats. Um, I wasn't here at the time, but looking back, we did have an inventory. It just wasn't, uh, it just wasn't a complete inventory. And since that time, what we've done is we've built in those controls, as Mr. Bigar was saying, and so we do have a complete inventory of our assets. Um, and, and, and note it, that it, it, it sounds like, if I might, uh, that you did not have a complete inventory and Apache Struts was not something that was able to be identified. Is that accurate? What, I have to, what I would say is this, um, the inventory for Apache struts is typically not in the inventory that you highlight in the report. And so it's a technical nuance, but the specifics of that particular vulnerability typically are not included in your the asset inventory. Because it's a source code vulnerability, it's typically in a code repository instead. Uh, well, again, we have a little difference of opinion on this one, so we'll follow up with you. And, and uh, again, it's about the future going forward. Are you telling me that something uh, uh, of the nature of Apache struts would not be in your current inventory, and therefore you would not be able to find that vulnerability today? No, it absolutely is in our inventory. So um, it should be in the inventory. It's it, it's just a it's a different type of inventory, Senator. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if they'd had it in the inventory that they were reviewing, clearly it would have made a difference. Do you agree with that statement? made a difference with respect to what, Senator? The ability to find the vulnerability. It would have, it would have helped. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sorensen, uh, thank you for being here too. And again, want to follow up on one of the points that we found in, in our investigation. It's true, the big breach happens at Starwood in 2014. Uh, then you acquire Starwood in 2016, is that correct? And then in 2018, now, you were able to identify that something happened. You said the alert was issued in 2018. However, we have uh, not mentioned today, there was a 2015 breach at Starwood that was acknowledged. And so when you bought Starwood, you knew about, I assume you knew about that breach, is that correct? Yes, yes we did. That breach uh, was a credit card uh, breach um, Numbers were taken at points of sale at 54 different properties. And in 2016, January 22nd, 2016 to be exact, uh, the president of Starwood sent a letter, a public letter out 
saying that the guest reservation database was not impacted by that breach. I have a copy of that letter uh, there on the witness table for you. Again, I would like to enter that 2016 letter into the record without objection. Um, of course, in reality, the reservation system had been breached considerably in 2014. So the letter said, don't worry, reservation system has, has not been breached. So my question to you is just a simple one. When you did your due diligence, which you talked about having done, um, did you look at that letter and did you examine this issue and could you have determined, therefore, earlier what, what happened? Yeah, that's a, it's a very fair question. The, the um, short answer is we, we knew about the point of sale breach that Starwood had suffered. Uh, we uh, worked with the Starwood team and we worked independently to try and make sure we understood the scope of that breach. As far as we know today, it was totally unrelated to the reservation system breach that we've been uh, talking about and announced in November. Different tools, uh, different system. In a, in a sense, the point of sale is obviously distributed at the properties, in the restaurants, and, and at the front desk. Uh, the reservation system, by comparison, which was the larger breach we disclosed in November, is a centralized system. Uh, again, the team has said they, they don't relate to each other, although certainly from a, um, a colloquial perspective, it, it feels similar. It feels like a warning. It feels like somehow it's relating to Starwood's customers, which it is. Uh, we, we did try and understand that point of sale thing, and we were satisfied that Starwood had taken the steps necessary in order to, to deal with that breach. Mm -hmm. Separately, we did some things on the reservations uh, platform side, but it was, in retrospect, clearly not enough. Well, again, lessons learned, and um, we appreciate the testimony you've already given us, and we appreciate the uh, opportunity to stay in touch with you and your, um, your experts to help to be sure that we are putting together the kind of legislation that can help avoid these problems in the future. Um, you made a statement earlier, uh, this is a race that has no finish line. I think that's accurate. I think it's also accurate that this is uh, a marathon that has to be run at a sprinter's pace. Uh, because there will be continual innovative hacking. I noticed this morning, to Senator Carper's point, that while the President was um, in Hanoi in negotiations with Chairman Kim, that there was a, an increase, apparently, this is a report, take it as such, um, in North Korean hacking, commercial hacking of U.S. targets. So it's, it's something that uh, we're going to have to continually assess, and government's not often good at that. You know, we put a law in place, as Senator Carper said, we don't do the proper oversight and follow-up, and we sometimes get uh, behind the curve. So we want your ongoing cooperation with this panel um, to be able to put together what makes sense and then to update it as, as necessary, because you're going to both be and your companies engaged in this for a long time into the future. Thank you again for being here, Senator Mr. Chairman, Carl. just a unanimous consent request, if I could, to yep. enter for the record articles uh, from uh, February 16th, New York Times, Chinese and Iranian hackers renew their attacks on U.S. companies. And the Wall Street Journal is, I think, as recently as yesterday. Iranian uh, hackers have uh, hit hundreds of companies in the past two years. I'd ask they be considered and included in the record. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for your testimony. Right, thanks to all of you. We'll go to Thank you both for your service. Thank you. Okay, we'll now call our second panel of witnesses for the hearing. Uh, please come forward, take a seat. This is the expert panel that's going to uh, give us information about how to solve so many of the problems we just talked about. Uh, we welcome you. We're going to start by introducing the, the panel. Uh, Alicia Cackley is here with us. She's Director of Financial Markets and Community Investment at the Government Accountability Office. We appreciate GAO's work on this issue and on this report. Uh, 
Second, we have Andrew Smith with us, who is Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. And third, we have John Gilligan with us. Uh, Mr. Gilligan is the President and Chief Executive Officer at the Center for Internet Security. Again, it's the custom of the subcommittee to swear in all witnesses, so at this time I'd ask you to stand up again and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, your written testimony will all be made part of the record. So if you could keep your uh, oral presentation to five minutes, that would be great. And um, Mr. Smith, I think we told you you'd go first, so we're going to call on you first. Thank you. Chairman Portman, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the subcommittee, I'm Andrew Smith, the Director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to, to present the Commission's views on how Congress can help the FTC further its efforts to prevent data breaches in the private sector. My written statement represents the views of the Commission, but this opening statement represents my views alone and not necessarily the views of the Commission or of any individual Commissioner. Let me begin by summarizing the FTC's current efforts to protect consumers by promoting data security and preventing data breaches. Our work has three primary areas of focus. The first is enforcement. For nearly two decades, the FTC has been the nation's leading data security enforcement agency. We're charged with enforcing data security requirements contained in specific laws, such <coughs> as Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, Fair Credit Reporting Act, and the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. But we also enforce Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive practices, including unfair and deceptive practices with respect to data security. In this law enforcement role, the Commission has settled or litigated more than 60 actions against businesses that allegedly fail to take reasonable precautions to protect their customers' personal information. For example, we've brought cases against manufacturers of consumer products like smartphones, computers, routers, connected toys. We've also brought cases against companies like data brokers that collect consumer sensitive personal information. Our second area of focus is policy making. The FTC has conducted workshops, issued reports, and made rules to promote data security. For example, just this week, we announced a notice of proposed rulemaking to update our safeguards rule under the Graham-Leach-Bliley Graham Act. The safeguards rule was originally issued in 2002 and requires financial institutions within the FTC's jurisdiction to implement reasonable process-based safeguards to protect personal information in their control. The proposed revisions to the safeguards rule are based on our nearly 20 years of enforcement experience. These revisions are intended to retain the process-based approach of the original rule while providing financial institutions with more certainty with respect to the FTC's data security expectations. Our third area of focus is business education. The Commission has issued numerous guidance materials for business, including a guide called Start with Security in 2015, a series of columns in 2017 called Stick with Security, and last year, a comprehensive small business cyber education campaign, which includes written guidance, how-to videos, and training materials for businesses. These materials distill the lessons learned from our enforcement actions in a succinct and accessible manner. We have vigorously used our existing authority to protect consumers. But this authority is limited in some important respects, and the Commission has called on Congress to enact comprehensive data security legislation that includes rulemaking, civil penalty authority, and enhanced jurisdiction for the FTC. First, the legislation should give the FTC the authority to issue data security rules under the Administrative Procedures Act so that we can keep up with business and technological changes. Where we currently have rulemaking authority, we've used it, as demonstrated by this week's proposed revisions to the safeguards rule, which I just described. Second, Legislation should allow the FTC to obtain civil penalties for data security violations. Currently, we have authority to seek civil penalties for data security violations under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We also can get civil penalties for violations of an existing administrative order. But as a general matter, we cannot obtain civil penalties in de novo cases. To help ensure effective deterrence, we urge Congress to enact legislation to allow the FTC 
to seek civil penalties for data security violations in appropriate circumstances. Finally, the legislation should extend the FTC's jurisdiction over data security to nonprofits and common carriers. Entities in these sectors often collect sensitive consumer information, and significant breaches have been reported, particularly in the educational and nonprofit hospital sector. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Cackley. Chairman Portman, Ranking Member Carper, my name is Alicia Puente Cackley, and I'm a director in the Financial Markets and Community Investment Team at the Government Accountability Office. I'm pleased to be here today to testify about internet privacy and data security issues. My statement will discuss the Federal Trade Commission's role and authorities for overseeing internet privacy and stakeholders' views on potential actions to enhance that federal oversight. My testimony is primarily based on our G January 2019 report on internet privacy, as well as prior GAO reports on various privacy issues. As you are aware, the United States does not have a comprehensive internet privacy law governing the collection, use, and sale or other disclosure of personal information. In prior work, we found that gaps exist in the federal privacy framework, which does not fully address changes in technology and the marketplace. At the federal level, FTC currently has the lead in overseeing internet privacy, using its statutory authority under Section 5 of the FTC Act to protect consumers from unfair and deceptive practices. However, to date, FTC has not issued regulations for internet privacy other than those protecting financial privacy and the internet privacy of children, which were required by law. For FTC Act violations, FTC may promulgate re regulations but is required to use procedures that differ from traditional notice and comment processes and that FTC staff said add time and complexity. Stakeholders GAO interviewed had varied views on FTC's overnight oversight of internet privacy. Most industry stakeholders said they favored FTC's current approach, direct enforcement of its unfair and deceptive practices statutory authority, which they said allows for flexibility. Other stakeholders, including consumer advocates and most former FTC and FCC commissioners GAO interviewed, favored having FTC issue and enforce regulations. Stakeholders identified three main areas in which internet privacy oversight could be enhanced. First, through statute. Some stakeholders told GAO that an overarching internet privacy statute could enhance consumer protection by clearly articulating to consumers industry, and agencies what behaviors are prohibited. Second, through rulemaking. Some stakeholders said that re regulations can provide clarity, fairness, and flexibility. And third, through civil penalty authority. Some stakeholders said FTC's internet privacy enforcement could be more effective with authority to level levy civil penalties for first-time violations. Recent data breaches at federal agencies, retailers, hospitals, insurance companies, consumer reporting agencies, and other large organizations highlight the importance of ensuring the security and privacy of personally identifiable information collected and maintained by those entities. Such breaches have resulted in the potential compromise of millions of Americans' personally identifiable information, which could lead to identity theft and other serious consequences. These recent developments regarding internet privacy and data security suggest that this is an appropriate time for Congress to consider comprehensive internet privacy legislation. Although FTC has been addressing internet privacy through its unfair and deceptive practices authority, and FTC and other agencies have been addressing this issue using statutes that target specific industries or consumer segments, the lack of a comprehensive federal privacy statute with specific standards leaves consumers' privacy at risk. In our January 2019 report, we recommended that Congress consider developing comprehensive legislation on internet privacy that would enhance consumer protections and provide flexibility to address a rapidly evolving internet environment. Issues that should be considered include which agency should oversee internet privacy, what authorities an agency should have for that oversight, including notice and comment, comment rulemaking authority and first-time violation civil penalty authority, and how to balance consumers' need for internet privacy with industry's ability to provide services 
and innovate. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, this concludes my prepared statement. I'm pleased to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony and, again, your help on this issue. Mr. Gilligan. Chairman Portman, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the subcommittee, uh, my name is John Gilligan. I serve as the Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Internet Security, or CIS, a nonprofit cybersecurity organization. In my oral statement this morning, I would like to share my perspectives on the logical question that may be asked after this morning's testimony, which is, what can be done to prevent major cybersecurity breaches? I asked myself a similar question in the early 2000s as the Chief Information Officer of the United States Air Force after the National Security Agency's annual penetration analysis found our cybersecurity posture to be woefully inadequate despite the Air Force spending literally over a billion dollars a year on cybersecurity. I went to NSA and asked them, where should I start? After consulting their offensive and defensive experts, NSA came back with a prioritized list of the system weaknesses that were most commonly exploited by attackers. By a large margin, the most common weakness exploited was misconfigured software. That is, software that did not have appropriate security settings enabled or software that was not properly patched. As a result of their guidance, I launched an initiative in the Air Force to ensure security-enabled configurations with up-to-date patches for all of our operating systems. Based on the positive experience with the Air Force in identifying most frequent cyber attack patterns and the associated mitigating security controls, the NSA effort was subsequently adopted by the private sector in 2009 and became known as the SANS Top 20. In 2015, the effort was transitioned to my current organization, the Center for Internet Security, and became named the Critical Security Controls, or just the CIS Controls. The critical security controls represent a set of an internationally recognized, prioritized actions that form the foundations for basic cyber hygiene or effective cyber defense. The controls are regularly updated by a global network of cyber experts. The critical security controls have been assessed as preventing up to 90 percent of pervasive and dangerous cyber attacks. The controls act as a clear, actionable, and free blueprint for system and network operators to improve cyber defense by identifying specific actions to be done in a priority order. CIS has analyzed major data breaches over the past two years and it found in each one the root cause of the breach was relates to the failure to properly implement one or more of the critical security controls. The Equifact breach is no exception. We found that there were five of the 20 critical security controls that were not properly implemented by Equifax. Many organizations are seeing the value of the critical security controls. California, Ohio, the Republic of Paraguay, Etsy, the European Standards, Technical Standards Organization, have adopted the controls as a standard for cybersecurity. Aerospace Industries Association and the Atlantic Council have also endorsed the critical security controls. As Congress considers ways to improve cybersecurity in the U.S., I offer the following recommendation. I start with the recognition that the NIST cybersecurity framework is an excellent top-level guidance document that points to other more detailed documents and best practices for implementation guidance, including the critical security controls. While a logical construct, this approach has some unintended consequences. In particular, government and private sector organizations who wish to implement the NIST cybersecurity framework must then select for implementation from among the very comprehensive list of standards, guidelines, and best practices that are referenced in the NIST framework. The same problem is magnified for organizations that are required to comply with multiple high-level frameworks that are similar to the NIST cybersecurity framework. For example, financial organizations are required to certify against the payment card industry, or PCI, security framework. Organizations with international presence are often required to follow the International Standards Organization, or ISO, cybersecurity framework, and so on. While the individual policies and regulations are well intended, they are contributing to much confusion and inefficiency in achieving the common goal of effective cyber defense. Recognizing that our multiple cybersecurity frameworks and duplicative policies have contributed to great confusion, I would recommend that NIST be chartered to develop a single 
cybersecurity implementation guideline that can be used to satisfy the requirements of the NIST cybersecurity framework, PCI, ISO, IEEE, and similar general security frameworks. This implementation guideline should provide clear guidance on what constitutes basic cyber hygiene and specify a prioritization for implementation of appropriate controls. I note that the United Kingdom and Australia have done exactly that with the Australian Signals Direct Directorate's Essential 8 and the United Kingdom's National Cybersecurity Center's uh, Cyber Essentials. I offer the Center for Internet Securities critical security controls as a point of departure or a model for such an effort. This concludes my remarks. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Gogan. Thanks to all three of the witnesses. Uh, as we heard this morning, these data breaches have become a fact of doing business, haven't they? And it, uh, it's a matter of constantly keeping up. Uh, it, it, it never ends. Uh, the best estimate we have, the most recent data we have, comes from the second, uh, the first half of 2018, and that is there were 291 data records compromised every second. 291 data records compromised every second. I don't think that's slowed down. It is probably increased. So it's an ever-present danger to consumers, to businesses, to our government, to our national security. Um, Mr. Smith, I found your testimony interesting. As has been alluded to today, uh, 50 states have different standards on this. Um, most states have passed their own breach notification laws. In fact, I think every state has some sort of breach notification law, don't they, Mr. Gogan? I, I believe that's the case. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's good, but they vary significantly from state to state. So let me ask you this, Mr. Smith, what benefit would there be from having a single standard for, at the federal level, for breach notification legislation, given, again, this climate we have of increased uh, technological interconnectedness and the number of breaches we're seeing? Right. Well, it seems like there would be some benefit to uniformity. I should, though, say that our current commission, so our commission, our commission, as you know, is composed of five commissioners. Mm -hmm. All of them are new within the last year or so, mm -hmm. and they have not had an opportunity to testify on whether or not they would support a uniform uh, data breach notification standard. Um, past commissions have supported such a uniform notification standard. But in what your are, personal capacity this, this afternoon now, what, what, what's your opinion? I was interested, actually, by what Mr. Sorensen said when he said it was, yes, it was a challenge, but it was not necessarily their primary challenge. And so I worked at the FTC in the early 2000s. And at that time, California had passed its first in the nation data breach notification standard. We dealt with it under the choice point breach, which was a huge breach at the time. Um, and we started looking at whether we should have a uniform standard. And in fact, the commission, I believe, testified in favor of it at that time. Bills were introduced, 2005, say we need a national standard. Uh, every state's going to enact their own standard. Um, well, every state has. And the sky hasn't fallen. So. I feel as though companies have probably figured out how to comply. I do have to say that I do think there is always a benefit to uniformity in terms of ease of compliance. Mm -hmm. um, but from what I can tell in the market, companies seem to be able to comply with these yeah. with this multiplicity of standards. Well, ease of compliance is one issue, and I do think that's something you know we'll hear about from the private sector that they would prefer to know what the standards are <clears throat> and not to uh, perhaps even inadvertently not follow a standard that's uh, that's different in state to state. But beyond that, you know, it's about protection. It's about the consumer. Right. It's about the government security and so on. So um, do you think there's some benefit to that? In other words, having a, a high standard that we can therefore ensure we have better security? So one of the critical aspects of any kind of a breach notification standard is the trigger for notification. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the er on the earlier panel it was mentioned that there's a 72-hour notice requirement in GDPR. Um, I think that there is, from, from the perspective of someone who focuses on consumer protection, I want to get notices to consumers that are useful, mm -hmm. right? That give them accurate, actionable, accurate yep. give them actionable information. I think the worst thing, and we've seen it in some of these breaches, is piecemeal notification. You know, one notice goes out, oh, we thought that this was breached and you should do this in response, and then another notice goes out, yep. oh, we've discovered this other asset was breached. This adds to the frustration. 
that people adds to the are frustration. Guilty. You need to give a company time to investigate. You know, they have to investigate quickly. Give them time to investigate, figure out who was affected, and what uh, what information was compromised, and what consumers can do to protect themselves, as well as develop the systems to respond. The 800 lines, the credit monitoring, yep. things like this. Yep. So, uh, you know, 30 days. 45 days, something like that. We have a rule, the FTC has a rule that applies to breaches of certain healthcare information where the standard is as quickly as possible, but in no event longer than 60 days. I don't know if that's the right cut or not, but it, you need to give people a little bit of time to conduct a thorough yeah, investigation. I don't disagree with that, but I think, I think 60 days is excessive given, could, given could well be, the right? fast moving uh, nature of this and, yeah. and the potential for uh, people's information to be compromised. Um, on the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act, I noted you talked about that in your oral remarks. I think the Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking uh, probably does give us more flexibility. In other words, as I said earlier, uh, the previous panel wouldn't be able to respond quickly to a changing threat because it's going to be ever evolving. However, there is concern that unless it was specifically related to um, rulemaking authority for cybersecurity legislation that it could get out of hand. Can you speak to that for a moment? Uh, one, do you think uh, rules under the APA are necessary, and do you think that'll add to flexibility? And second, uh, how do you narrow it to being sure that it's, it's uh, responsive to the congressional actions we might take on this one issue? Right. So the Commission has testified in favor of APA rulemaking for data security only. Mm -hmm. And I think what um, folks imagine would be a bill like several that we've seen introduced, where Congress says, companies, you shall assess risk and develop a plan to keep data safe and maybe provide some other boundaries for what the program ought to look like. Mm -hmm. And FTC, you shall have rulemaking authority under the Administrative Procedure Act. Only for that to execute that, that law, right? Not rule, APA rulemaking authority for everything in the world. Um, what we have right now, and, and was referred to by Ms. Cackley, is uh, rulemaking authority under the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, which requires us not only to do notices of proposed rulemaking and taking of comments, we have to do advanced notices of proposed rulemaking, we have to have hearings, we have to issue interim reports, we have to allow for interim appeals. What that means, it's not impossible to do, mm -hmm. but what it means is that, you know, from soup to nuts, a MAGMOS rule takes us 10 years. Yeah, it slows down so, the process considerably. Right. One final point, then I'll go to Senator Carper on the uh, nonprofits you mentioned, uh, and you said that private carriers and nonprofits um, should be under the FTC rubric for this purpose. Um, can you give us a couple examples of that? I'm thinking about hospitals where there have been some breaches, as an example, where sensitive medical information could be released inadvertently, sometimes, sometimes through hackers. Right. About that. So hospitals, the issue with if it's medical information, healthcare information, and it's a hospital, then that will be covered by HIPAA. Um, which, and we work closely with HHS and the Office of Civil Rights to, uh, to enforce and administer uh, HIPAA standards. Um, what we have seen with nonprofit hospitals are breaches of employee data, not covered by HIPAA. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a real challenge. We have also seen breaches at educational institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and we have seen breaches at common carriers, and there is, I think, bit of an open question about the Federal Communications Commission's um, authority jurisdiction to address those, yeah. jurisdiction to address those yeah. breaches. Okay. All things to look at. Thank you. Senator Carper. Thank you for a really illuminating testimony this morning. You're sitting out in the audience and I don't know what you're thinking about, but you came to the table prepared and it's very much appreciated. One of the things that's always helpful to me is when we have uh, a, uh, a uh, panel of uh, well-informed, thoughtful uh, witnesses uh, is to see where do you think you agree? Uh, and the question will be, where do you think you agree as a panel with respect to what Congress should do next? Would you just start us off, uh, Ms. Cackley? Senator, I think where, um, where certainly um, my testimony and, and uh, uh, Mr. Smith's testimony were in agreement was around the need for a legislation and and what some of the elements of that legislation could include, um, which is to say, um, notice and comment rulemaking authorities, civil penalty authorities. Those were the things that um, would 
best help the, the FTC or whichever agency Congress chooses to invest with, with uh, this issue, um, oversight over this issue, um, the, the necessary tools to be able to, to get the job done. All right, thank you. Mr. Smith, where, where do you think uh, the three of you agree on what we should be doing next, our to-do list, if you will? Well, I mean, um, particularly with respect to the statutory authority for the Federal Trade Commission to make rules in the area of data security and uh, enforce using civil penalties um, and, and also the expanded jurisdiction, we certainly agree on that. And I um, agree with Mr. Gilligan from CIS about the importance of uh, these uh, useful rubrics like the CIS critical security controls to educate businesses and to focus their attention on things that really matter. For a lot of businesses, I believe I, I think that um, data security is just a, sort of a, an, 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 an insurmountable obstacle. It's beyond anyone's comprehension. And these types of, um, of, of rubrics, I think, help businesses to focus their attention in the right place. We've done the same thing this week with our GLBA safeguards rule, where we have the rule began life in 2002 and at the time was quite influential, but it's very basic. I mean, it's about that long. And it requires companies to have good data security, conduct data assessments, appoint people to be responsible. In our new rule, which is somewhat longer, we offer more specifics about encryption and penetration testing and some of the other best practices um, which, one, provides businesses with an auditable standard, provides them with clear, clear information about our expectations, and also, pro candidly, provides us with more ability to enforce. Mr. Gilgan, same question. Where do you agree? Well, I think there's fundamental agreement that a uh, complex issue, um, there are a number of regulatory bodies, the Federal Trade Commission being one, who have jurisdictions over part of our economy. Um, one of the, the, uh, the, the functions that the Center for Internet Security provides is what we call the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center, where we provide under funding from Congress and under DHS uh, uh, sponsorship, we provide security support for state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. Included in state, local, tribal, and territorial is almost every different domain that you might imagine. And they're all struggling dealing with cybersecurity. Um, while I, I personally am not an expert in data breach reporting, I can say that the, the states and local governments are struggling trying to deal with all of the, the well-intended regulations that I mentioned in, in my testimony. And so I think um, some consolidation of that and simplification, and, and as I suggested, perhaps using something like the critical security controls is really the technical implementation foundation. That's where most organizations, and that needs to be continuously updated, uh, that's what most organizations need to help focus. And as I said, you know, the breaches that have been um, uh, discovered invariably are uh, the result of failure to implement very simple controls in a comprehensive way. The, um, I asked my staff to, to gather uh, a handful of uh, tips if, uh, for consumers, for, for regular folks. Uh, to, uh, to follow if they become a, a data breach uh, victim. And uh, the, uh, the, the short list, not a comprehensive list, but uh, one of those is change your, change your password. Another would be to contact your bank or your credit card company. Third would be to contact uh, a credit uh, reporting bureau. And a, a fourth would be to sign up for credit monitoring. And that's for folks who had become a, a, a breach a victim. What, uh, Mr. Gillian, what would you suggest that uh, consumers can do to protect themselves, like prospectively, not in, after they become a victim, but prospectively? Any tips? Well, I, I think it would be largely parallel to the list you just mentioned. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is that all uh, consumers freeze their credit reporting, uh, which is often a vehicle um, through which um, the uh, the, uh, uh, their, their particular uh, personal information is compromised. I, I think having, having good hygiene uh, with regard to passwords, with regard to uh, updates and security software are also things that, that all consumers should do on a regular basis in order to protect themselves. 
Hey, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, Ms. Cackley, anything you want to add to that, uh, to that list? I would say that I, I would direct consumers to our website, ftc.gov, where we have a tremendous amount of information about how to protect yourself um, in the event of a data breach, both general information as well as specific information. So, for example, we have pages that are dedicated to tax identity theft. Uh, we have a page uh, dealing with connected toys. Um, just a couple of months ago, in December of 2018, there was a phishing scam where consumers received what appeared to be authentic emails from Netflix saying, you need to provide us with your payment information again. We developed a specific page in consumer education to deal with that specifically because it was an important threat to consumers. We also uh, built pages for the Marriott breach and the Equifax breach that gave specific information for consumers who had received those notices about what they could do to protect themselves, including some of the measures that your, that your staff mentioned. And finally, uh, where consumers believe that they may be a victim of identity theft, they need to go to identitytheft.gov, which is operated by the FTC. And there we have tools such as the identity theft affidavit that you can use uh, with the credit bureaus to have, uh, to have fraudulent information removed from your, from your credit report, as well as, uh, as, as, well as receive um, other, other rights under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Thank you. Ms. Cockley, one last word. Um, I would say just that consumers need to educate themselves. Thinking prospectively, they need to understand uh, what data is uh, potentially uh, available to other, other people, uh, their company, what companies are collecting their data, and how they can, can set privacy controls potentially or do whatever else they, they can to, to uh, uh, keep themselves safe. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, you're, uh, you had to wait here for a while in order to share your thoughts with us, but for us it was well worth the wait, and we thank you very much. I uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate the, the testimony and also the ongoing uh, work with us on this because we've got some real expertise here. And by the way, with regard to the FTC, uh, I think I speak for uh, Senator Carper on this too. We, we really want you to feel responsible. In other words, one of the concerns that I've had is there's so much of this going on, uh, breaches, some of which uh, relates to private companies, some, uh, as you mentioned earlier, nonprofits. Um, so many people are concerned about where their information is going, even if it's not a business per se that you would normally think of, as we saw in the earlier panel, but even any of these websites where you know, you're giving information and that information is then being given out to other people, folks want to know about it. And so I hope, and maybe uh, Ms. Puente Cackley can, can uh, do some work on this going forward, that you all feel empowered to be, to be that one uh, stop for a consumer. You know, if they have a concern, they can go to your website and figure out both what's going on with a specific uh, issue, as we talked about earlier, if there's been a breach at a big company and, and you know, they can find out what the uh, information is about how they can protect themselves but also just general information. So I assume you feel you have that responsibility already, uh, but we want to be sure that whatever legislation we do squarely puts that responsibility, frankly, and accountability on the FTC. Any thoughts on that? Well, w we are the country's only general jurisdiction consumer protection agency. So we, of course, we have a lot of consumer protection agencies, the FDA or the Securities mm -hmm. and Exchange Commission or the banking agencies. Um, we're the only ones who have take a general view to the whole marketplace. Um, and we believe that we are the best equipped to address, you know, should Congress pass legislation with respect to data security or privacy, we believe that we are the agency that is best equipped to enforce and administer that statute, not only because of our 20, more than 20 years' experience with privacy and data security. Um, in fact, if you look at the Fair Credit Reporting Act, that statute's been around since 1970, mm -hmm. and we've been in char charge of enforcing and administering it. Um, but also just our general know-how with respect to how to protect consumers and our focus on consumer harm, whether it's deceptive practices or unfair practices. Um, and we have the goods to show for it, right? We've brought 60 cases plus in the data security area and the same in the privacy area. Um, and I, finally, I would say that I think that we, unlike a, an agency that has specific jurisdiction 
I think we're less susceptible to capture. If you look at the more than 100 year history of the FTC, we have proven remarkably immune to that. And I would worry about um, a, a special agency to deal with privacy in terms of the potential for regulatory capture. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think that is consistent with where uh, we would like to go with legislation just to affirm that and to make sure there's a, there's a clear line of responsibility. My final question is about Ohio, of course, and it's to Mr. Gilligan because he mentioned Ohio in his list of states and countries that have put in place some kind of a Internet security control system. Um, we have recently in Ohio established our Center for Internet Security Controls as a standard for cyber defense after passing the Ohio Data Protection Act. Could you discuss briefly the role of these CIS controls within the Ohio Data Protection Act and how legislation of this kind can incentivize companies to implement some of these baseline cyber controls we've talked about today? Well, thank, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, the, the Ohio legislation is, is one of the uh, groundbreaking legislations in that it, for the first time, it provides specific guidance with regard to uh, expectations for cybersecurity. And as you mentioned, um, it, it does, does reference a couple of the uh, federal um, guidelines, so it references uh, several NIST uh, documents. But the critical security controls is the only one of those that really provides specific implementation guidance. And so we believe that that's, that's the type of guidance that is, uh, that is uh, required. As you know, the Ohio legislation is voluntary, and the intent of it is really to provide positive incentives to those doing business within Ohio to, to improve their status of cybersecurity. And, and we think that's, that's sort of the right way to go, to, to provide a clear definition of what are the expectations, um, encourage through positive rewards, um, organizations to comply with those, uh, uh, those uh, best practices and, uh, and to, to serve as an example for, uh, for industry uh, as well. Thank you, Mr. Gilman. Senator Carper. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, before we close, I just want to thank a, a couple of members of our staff from the majority side and minority side uh, by, by name and, 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 and serve for the record the names of some other folks who've worked on this. We've been at this for a while and some people who come and gone. And I want to just uh, have those names entered for the record. But on majority staff, Andy Dockham and Patrick Warren, especially for, for their hard work, and there are others I know as well. On uh, minority staff, I want to thank uh, Roberto Barrios and Brandon uh, Rivas and uh, Marin uh, uh, on and John Kilvickton, uh, our law clerks, uh, Connor Daly, Justin Azar, and uh, Taylor Burnett uh, helped us prepare for this hearing. And then I have we have a number of folks who are former staff, former law clerks, who have gone on to other pursuits, but we're grateful and we'll enter those names for the record. But you're only as good as the people we have behind us, and we're blessed by the folks that sit behind us and help us. Thank you, Senator Carper. And again, thank the witnesses uh, for their testimony this morning. Both panels, I thought, were, were very informative. And I also want to thank your staff, uh, Senator Carper, and you for leading on this important issue of protecting consumer information. Uh, it's how we work here. It's a nonpartisan approach. And uh, my staff also uh, deserves recognition for doing, doing, doing a great job in working, I think, with, with uh, our witnesses and, and others to make sure this was a thorough investigation. As with our other investigations, we're going to be looking at legislation, so we want your continued help on that. I look forward to working with Senator Carper on that. The hearing record will remain open for 15 days for any additional comments or questions uh, by any of the subcommittee members. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.